Bismillah ve Allah'ın kitabı. Ya Allah, Resulü Kadah ya. O nana kendi bir kuyt. O kuyt. Mekke ofte kontrol ol kisitin. Ya den o kuyt. O da o şahit ol fayyonim. Nasıl usayt fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 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 Thank you very much, sir. Um, that is uh, the opening prayer. All right, so um, before we move into the next item on the agenda, um, I remember a famous writer, um, Simon Snake, who wrote a book, a famous book, uh, Start With Why. So it's like, we asking ourselves, why are we here? So if we are to make it short, of course, we will see we're here because we care about the healthcare of our dear state, neither states, right? But to, just to put things into perspective, which I believe um, the next person who I'm going to invite is going to even do more of that. Um, despite improvements, of course, in the healthcare system, neither states in particular continues to have or to see uh, maternal death and even child death in the states. Um, there was a report that I read that says one in every uh, 95 women uh, in Niger state died uh, during, uh, because of uh, complications uh, during pregnancy and even during childbirth. So I think that is still worrying, you know, to say one in 95 women, a death of a woman due to due to childbirth or pregnancy we in nigeria health watch we believe that no woman should die while trying to give a life and of course we're here to have this conversation uh, with our incredible distinguished uh, panelists and key speakers keynote speakers on how we can um we can talk about solutions engaging conversation not just within this hall but conversations that will go back to our communities in Niger and even beyond. So uh, to kickstart this event, um, I would like to call on the director of programs, Nigerian Health Watch, uh, Mrs. Kemisola Aboye. Uh, Mrs. Kemisola, you're welcome. Please give a round of applause. Good morning, everyone. This is the first time anyone has ever called me Mrs. By the way, it's kind of weird. I'm not used to it. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Kamisola Gwaoye. I am director of programs at Nigeria Health Watch, and I want to welcome you to this policy dialogue. This is the second of our subnational policy dialogues. Um, historically, Nigeria Health Watch has conducted these policy dialogues at the national level, but last year we decided to do something different. Um, and I'll tell you why. So we know how important primary health care is to the achievement of universal health coverage. We know that um, universal health coverage means that everyone everywhere, regardless of where they live, who they are, how much they have, are able to access quality health care. And for us at Nigeria Health Watch, that really is the end game for all of the advocacy that we do. Nigeria Health Watch is a health communications and advocacy organization. We work out of Abuja. And what we do is to advocate for better access to quality healthcare for all Nigerians, such that people can access good quality healthcare without going into poverty. And that's why we do what we do. Um, so historically, we've done this in a number of ways. We know that Nigeria has over 34,000 primary healthcare centers in the country, but only about 20% of these are functional. We also know that um, we have really poor health indices. Maternal health and maternal death rates continue to rise. As of the last National Demographic and Health Survey, it was still 512 per 100,000, which is really high, one of the highest in the region. 
We know that child health indices are also really poor. We know that um, there is a lot of work to do to improve these indices, to ensure that people have access to quality healthcare. Nigeria has done quite a bit, actually, to improve this, both at national level and subnational levels. At national level, for example, there is the revitalization of 10,000 PHCs. So the government wanted to make sure that there will be at least one functional primary health care center in each ward. We know how that's going. Um, we still have only 20% of our PHCs functional. Um, we also know that there was the PHC under one roof policy such that healthcare in primary healthcare centers is integrated and streamlined. So that would make sure that resources are effectively used and um, healthcare is more streamlined, more seamless. Then there's also the BHCPF, Basic Healthcare Provision Fund, that basically seeks to make sure that the poor and the vulnerable have access to quality healthcare at no cost. Um, significant improvements have been made in that regard. We know that Niger is also implementing. I'll come to why Niger later. So Nigeria Health Watch has, over the years, um, since we started um, advocacy around primary health care, we've done quite a few things to, to advocate for improved services in that sector. For example, we have done rapid generation of evidence. One of the things we did was to assess the state of watch facilities in primary healthcare centers. We did this in Niger, in FCT, and in Kaduna State. And we've engaged with all the stakeholders here over time over this. The other thing we also did, we did a rapid assessment of the um, of access to maternal and child healthcare services in Kano State. This was in 2019. Then we hosted a policy dialogue in Kano last year. We find that it is more impactful and more important for these conversations to be have to be happening closer to the communities you know we could sit in abuja or sit in, at the national level and have these conversations about primary health care and how it needs to be improved we can host summits we can put a lot of money into conferences and say you need to improve primary health care services but if you're not actively listening to the community members to the people who actually access health care services in these primary health care centers then we've lost a huge chunk of what is most important. And this is why we started the Community Health Watch Project. The Community Health Watch Project basically just empowers community members to report on their own experiences accessing primary health care services in their communities. And then we take their voices and we use our platforms to amplify them. We've seen significant changes. We piloted this project right here in Niger State. So yes, that is why Niger. And we Niger is one of the most responsive states that we've had to engage with on this, I must say. Um, when the Community Health Watch project started, the state actually invited us, the State Primary Healthcare Board, represented by Dr. Geneva here, invited us to dialogue. Um, you're getting very interesting findings on you know, the state of PhDs in this state. Let's dialogue, let's have a dialogue about how that can change. And that is one of the reasons why we're here today. We thought, these are some of the things that have happened over time. These are some of the community accountability mechanisms that have been piloted over time. What can we learn from it? How can we strengthen these community accountability mechanisms for improved primary health care services? Now let's talk about women. Half of Nigerians are women. Um, the health workforce globally is mostly women, 70%, minimum 70% women but only 28% of the leaders in the health workforce are women, which means that when policies are being formulated, women's voices are usually not included because women are not sitting at those tables. The women in the communities don't get heard because they are not in the meetings where decisions about their own health are made. And this is why the What Women Want campaign was really important, which we are also implementing in Niger. You can see that we love Niger State very much. So community voices, women's voices, right? So we went into communities and asked women, what do you want for your health and well-being? With, um, in collaboration, it supports to the State Primary Healthcare Board, we've been implementing women's voices for action. And like I said earlier, Niger State is one of the most responsive states. There's some things that Niger State has done in really short time that are really remarkable. For example, you have at least one midwife in each of your 274 focal PHCs in the state. That's impressive. And you went one step further because we know that one of the major issues with the health workforce is actually retention. So you could post them there, but when people actually come to access healthcare in those communities, 
the midwives are not there, the um, nurses are not there, healthcare workers are not there. And you, sometimes you really can't blame them. I'm going to whisper this away from Dr. Janeja. You can't blame them because of the realities of living in those communities, which is why we also listen to midwives' voices, but that's just by the side. The other thing the state did was to conduct supervision visits to all of these facilities to make sure that the midwives they had deployed were actually there. And for us, I think that's really responsive leadership. We think that's a lot of potential, and we think that there are some things that Niger State is doing right that other states can learn from. And that's what this dialogue is about. We're going to be talking about community accountability mechanisms. So how can the community, for example, community MPCDSR committees be set up? How can you set up committees within communities such that maternal, perinatal, and child deaths are surveilled? We institute surveillance mechanisms for those, and you review them, and you put in measures to correct them going forward. How can community members be empowered to demand for better quality primary health care services? How can their voices be taken, be collated, and amplified? How can we make sure that people understand what quality primary health care means and that they demand for it when they are accessing health care? How can we make sure that communities recognize their role in ensuring that primary health care is what they are getting, quality primary health care is what they are getting? when they go to access healthcare. These are the discussions we're here to have. NIDA has done a lot, I think, and we can learn from that. Are there still gaps that persist? Are there lessons that we've learned that we can build on? How can we bridge the gaps that still remain in ensuring quality PH services? It's not one size fits all. We know how, we know how our PHC story is in Nigeria. We know how much of an uphill climb it has been. But there are things that have worked and we need to discuss those things and make sure that we scale them up and we get other states to learn from them. And that's why we decided to come to Niger States to have this policy dialogue. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for making the time. I know it wasn't easy coming all the way to Sulija, but I think this is the closest to the community these conversations can get. And it's not a town hall, it's a policy dialogue because truly, when it comes to the formulation and implementation of policies, community members and community voices need to be incorporated. And that's why we're doing this. So thank you so much. I hope you have a good time. Please share your thoughts, use your voices. We're going to be amplifying this on social media and we can't wait to see what happens after this. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Temu. Um, of course, so she talked about a lot of things. Of course, she I told you she's going to talk about more of the why, and she did, and even why in United States, right? Not just why we will be talking about healthcare or maternal health and child, but why are we in United States? And she said she thanked you for coming to Sulaja. And I remember having a conversation with one of um, uh, my colleague, I asked her, why are we bringing these people all the way to Sulaja, not in Mina? She said, that's Niger for you. Wherever you take them, they will go. They're very serious about that. So yes, I'm happy and we're happy to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for coming once again. Uh, before I go into the next item, I would like to recognize uh, some personalities uh, in the high table in front of me. Um, the first person on my right, we have uh, Dr. Junaidu Inwa. He's the Director of Health Planning, Research and Statistics uh, from the Niger State Primary Healthcare. Please can we give a round of applause to Dr. Junaidu. We have Madam Anna Simon, uh, the NLC Chairman and also Deputy Director of Reproductive Health. Um, welcome, a round of applause for her please. Also I have Dr. Aminu Magaji, I believe he's the one very close to Dr. Inwa. He's the uh, MD Mariam Babangida Maternal and Child Health Hospital. Please, a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming, sir. We have uh, Mr. Felix Iba. I would like to have you on the high table, sir. Mr. Felix Iba is from the Coalition of CSOs in Niger State. Um, if we can have you in the high table. All right, thank you so much. We appreciate your coming. Um, we have Madam Hadiza M. Shiru. Madam Hadiza, I'm sure, is the permanent secretary, Women Affairs. Thank you so much. A round of applause for her. Thank you for coming, Ma. 
We have another Madam Hadiza Egau. She's the OIC Pakongu PHC, uh, in Chanchaga local government. Please a round of applause. We have two Hadizas on the high table. Nice to have you around. And then we have by my left here, I have Malam Hassan Isa Ushishi. He's the secretary WHTC Lima Wa E Chanchaga. Highly welcome, sir. A uh, very vibrant uh, community leader. I remember engaging with him during one of our advocacy visit in United States. Thank you so much for coming. Last but not least, um, I would like to have uh, Rabiu Abubakar. He is a healthcare reporter uh, uh, with the Nigeria Health Watch. Please, can we have you in the high table? Rabiu Abubakar, please, if you can come over to the high table. Please, a round of applause for Rabiu Abubakar. Thank you so much. So now, um, that's it. Having established um, our people uh, in the high table, as well as um, all of you distinguished guests, um, participants, we highly welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. I would like to move into the next item in the agenda, which is keynote address by our executive director, United States Primary Healthcare Development Agency, who is ably represented uh, by Dr. Junaid Inwa. He is going to give a keynote address on the topic accountability and innovation on primary health care, strengthening communities for improved health care service delivery in Niger State, as it is our theme for the policy dialogue. Thank you so much, sir. Please, a round of applause for him as he comes forward. All right, um, before I start, I think I just want to give a few comments to what the, the head of the program said. First, we want to, on behalf of everyone, I just want to thank you for that comment, beautiful comment about us. I think it's good you've said things like that in front of some of our seniors that are here and policymakers. So thank, can we give a round of applause? Uh, you know, for a very long time, I think the, Coalition for SADA here, I think we testified that for a very long time, Niger State has always provided an enabling ground for partners to come and then we partner with work with them. So most of that, while other states are fighting with CSOs, CSOs are our colleagues in Niger State. We fight, we argue, we challenge each other. And then our common goal is to ensure that we improve healthcare across the farm healthcare. So let's give ourselves a round of applause. The permanent secretary, Minister of Human Affairs, who are, have always been with us every time we have a program like this. The head of Jumai Babangida, Matana and Chahada Hospital, in person of Dr. Aminu Magaji. The NLC chairman, she said, why do I identify an NLC chairman? We don't want to let you know that even people at the NLC are represented here and then they participated in strengthening in person of Anna Simon, and then OICs, our WTC participants, civil society organization, program officers, and then our hosts. Is it, is it Nigerian Health World or Sidani or uh, where's your other name? White Ribbon, which one do I say? Nigerian Health World, all right. Nigerian Health World, all right. And then men of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as of this morning, I think at 12 midnight last night, I think the ED, I was fully communicating with him. And I think he said he's going to be around as at 12 midnight. Unfortunately, maybe I know most of us in the state knew, unfortunately, he couldn't make it just this morning. And I just got to know that we'll have tried. But we're glad one of our permanent secretary, one of the most senior is here with us. So I think that has already down the tension and then it can mine up a little bit, especially now that it's going to be at the media, we need to have a senior colleague here. But then he sent his apology and then a lot of things come up. Most of you know that he's the commissioner nominee. So many things are going on. As of this morning, the governor just called him to Abuja. So he's unavoidably absent. Please, he sent his apology. And then he said, whatever happens and whatever transpires, I should let him be in the picture. And then you find time to see you either as an ED or probably as a honorable commissioner. 
So whatever you see him here, I didn't put this. Please, is his word, and please hold him responsible, not me. Now let me start by appreciating all stakeholders and partners for the work we do in strengthening primary health care, especially in Niger State. As you continue to improve access to quality primary health care for everyone everywhere in the state and to contribute to achieving the Sustainable Development Goal SDG 3, which is good health and well-being for all by the year 2030, acknowledging that primary health care is central to achieving SDG 3. As stakeholders in the primary health care sector, we are quite familiar with the indices, very, very familiar. The recent mixed report of 2021 showed that there have been a tremendous improvement in the PSC indicators compared to what we had in NDHS report of 2018. Infant and child mortality has improved from 55 per 1,000 live births to 98 per 1,000 live births. Has improved from 98 to 44,000 per 1,000 live births and 61,000 live births. Likewise, the percentage of children who receive all essential vaccines and birth assisted by skilled professionals has improved from 23% to 25%, and then 34 from 23 and 25 to 34 and 38 respectively. While this indicates that we are moving in the right direction, more, more needs to be done, especially if you are to meet the SDG 3 by the year 2030. And if we, must, if we must achieve this, then we must strengthen community accountability for improved healthcare services delivery in Niger State through innovative, innovative ways. The community, of course, we are aware is very crucial to work we do. And achieving health for all the Niger State needs an approach that hears from the community. With this understanding, we have convened today for this PSC dialogue to discuss the theme strengthening community accountability mechanism for quality primary healthcare, spotlighting Niger State. We aim to discuss the need for innovative platform to hear the voices of the community, healthcare workers and the stakeholders at the community level. Focus on one of such platforms, which is the Community Maternal, Perinatal and Child Death Surveillance Review Committee. In Niger State, we have a culture of being very open to innovations, especially health-related ones. We have witnessed remarkable transformation in the healthcare landscape in the last decade, like making data-driven decisions for the PAC. We are breaking new ground and realizing our vision for accessible and equitable healthcare for all. Ladies and gentlemen, at the heart of accountability and innovation lies in strengthening our communities. We recognize that effective healthcare delivery does not occur in isolation. It is a collaborative effort that involves every member of the society. When communities are empowered and mobilized, they become active agents of change, demanding quality services, participating in health campaigns, and championing healthy lifestyle. We must listen to these voices and incorporate these insights to ensure their perspectives are included in our various program designs and implementation. By doing this, we improve health outcome and foster a sense of ownership and pride in our healthcare services. Let us remember that our journey toward improved health service delivery in Niger State is a collective responsibility. It requires consistent commitment, collaboration, and unwavering determination. Accountability and innovation are the tools that will propel us forward on this path. And strengthening our community is the compass that guides our way. Together, we can build a legacy for accessible, equitable, and quality primary health care for future generations. Let us be a change maker, the advocate, and the champion of healthy and justice. Thank you all, and God bless. so much our ever representative of ed so many points there i love the statistics given in the first uh part of the speech 
And I loved how he kept emphasizing on collective effort, involving community members in order to see that our healthcare, our health service delivery is effective and to the quality that we deserve. Such kind of voices from the community is one of the reasons why we're here. We have gone to communities in Niger State, as all of you are aware, including, of course, the ED. We have spoken to community members, community members women, women, you know, head of households, community leaders, some of you who are here, you know, WDCs, to hear your own perspective. And we're here to move that conversation like um, further. And that's why we're here. So now talking about um, community voices. Um, the next in our agenda, if you look at the paper in your hands, um, we're going to have our first panel session. Um, but before that, um, as I said earlier, talking about community voices, I would like to play a video, um, a short documentary, which is not, of course, going to take much of your time. And then before we go into the first um, uh, conversation proper, so please, I indulge you to just pay a little attention, just five minutes, I think, of your time. To improve accountability in primary health care services, Nigeria Health Watch in To improve accountability in primary health care services, Nigeria Health Watch in August 2021 launched the Community Health Watch project to monitor our report on access and delivery of primary health care services in rural communities across Nigeria. In addition to weekly reports, we conducted community engagement meetings in Niger State to understand the experiences of community members in accessing health care and the experiences of health workers in providing care to the people. The community engagement uncovered several challenges affecting access and delivery of health care in rural communities. The most pressing issues that seemed to face the communities we visited in Niger State were issues surrounding maternal health care delivery, water, sanitation and hygiene, and inadequate human resources for health. In both Nankogi and Maitre communities in Mushinshu local government area, facilities do not provide 24-hour care due to inadequate manpower. We went to Internata here and they used to attend us. They used to give us the tablets, everything we need. Sometimes we used to get level from night, sometimes in the middle night. So we don't used to see them. They used to close. The, the staff that were present, they are all for daytime, from 8 o'clock to, uh, to 4 o'clock. After that period, there will be anybody again. That the community is left with nothing but to be carrying their patient in the night to Ushishi, which is a neighboring town. Much a Michiki, now put a yaka mata, and you rush into Zua as it. Soon a tashi can be the Anja Anjuma and Tashi. Azuna, I cover to you at Kingali. When the pine desire, I turn the Babu Maikata as it. And those who make me tight try in Nata. 
ko kaman haihuwan farko an fi samun wadannan matsalolin ko kuma idan mace ta haihu yayi yawa tana da haihuwa kamar ce bakwai takwas an shi ma jiki ya riga ya sanyi dole sai ta samu taimako along with inadequate staffing both phcs have inadequate water sanitation and hygiene facilities this is consistent with findings from nigeria health watch's assessment of water sanitation and hygiene services in primary healthcare centers in niger state and fct in 2020 findings showed more than 50% of phcs in niger state not having a source of water within them and 41% do not have enough toilets for males and females. Sometimes, in the, in the evenings, some people used to give bed when they are around in the hospital. So we don't have water. And we used to go to another place to have water. And the water is not even good to drink or have to give the baby. We don't have toilets. If you want to invest in the outside, the hospital and you will wait. Sometimes we used to enter bush and we will wait. the most dollars are kicked out with enough staff even if you provided enough staff you should provide them with shifting allowances so that in the morning there will be some people that will do that in the evening there will be some people that will be taking care so that in the in the 24 hours there will be no short of uh, services in addition to these challenges highlighted, the health facilities in Bangkoyi and Maito communities both face security issues and poor infrastructure, have never heard of functional fence, and the roofs are leaking and have holes, forcing health workers to share their facilities with birds. For health facilities to provide quality healthcare services, necessities such as adequate human resources for health, water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities, and a comfortable and secure environment must be in place. We therefore call on Wishishu Local Government Council and the Niger State Government to ensure that health facilities under their domain are well equipped to serve their communities. All right. Um... Thank you so much for your time. Um, I don't know, but can I say we should give a round of applause for all of us. Now, this round of applause is um, for the United States government, the Ushishi local government, and the good people of that local government. And of course, um, our production unit and the entire team of Nigerian Health Watch who were able to put this uh, documentary that we've just watched now. So, of course, we've, I told you earlier, and as you know, that we've been going to these communities, we've been speaking to these community members. Um, this documentary has been made, I think, um, a year ago. So, yes, um, there have been improvements, of course, um, which I believe in some of the document in your hands, you will see some stories where we visited, we revisited some of the PHCs after we reported. And that's to say that the local government as well as the state government are of course listening to us. They are watching us, they are reading our reports, they are following us to say bumper to bumper, yes. So we reported on some communities and on the some dilapidated PHCs. And interestingly, a year after when we go back, we've seen that of course things have improved. But still there are communities when there are issues that are still persistent and which is why we're having this conversation today how can we move forward how can we create a better um, avenue for women and children to have to access health care in niger states to move further this conversation i would like to without much ado uh, introduce my first panel 
uh, panelists as well as the moderator. I would like to start with uh, introducing the moderator, Mr. Chupite Alaboso. Mr. Chupite Alaboso will be moderating the first panel session discussion um, with the title Increasing Community Demand for, community, uh, for Quality PHC Services. Mr. Alaboso is the Senior Programs uh, Manager in Nigeria Health Watch. Please, a round of applause as we have Mr. Alaboso to the high table. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chibike. Yes, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, don't go in front. Um, sorry, please. Um, okay, I would like to invite my first panelist. Uh, Marlon Hassan onto the panel, please. You're welcome. Marlon Hassan is the, as I introduced him earlier, is the secretary at WHDC. Um, thank you so much for that. All right, Malahasan, awesome, please, you can go on to the high stage. Thank you so much. Um, next, I have uh, Madam Hadiza Ga Ahmed Gau. Please, a round of applause for Madam Hadiza Ahmed Gau. She's a health uh, care professional with more than a decade experience in community health. Uh, she holds a diploma in community health. Uh, from the School of Health Technology, MINA, and also a diploma in education from Kaduna State Polytechnic. Um, she's among, uh, among her key strengths are patients, as she wrote, uh, perseverance, power of communications, planning, and organization. Adiza Ahmad Gao is currently the officer in charge of Pakungu Primary Health Care Center, MINA, in Niger State. She also doubled as the coordinator of maternal and child health uh, at Chanchaga Local Government uh, of uh, United States. Once again, welcome, Mom. I have um, the next person um, is Mala Rabiu Abakar. Mala Rabiu Abakar, please a round of applause for Mala Rabiu Abakar. Mala Rabiu Abakar is. Um, is from Oshishi local government, is a community health uh, reporter um, with the Nigerian Health Watch uh, for over two years. He, he specializes on mentoring young ones to become very useful to their community, uh, more especially in terms of uh, education. He likes learning new things, likes to collect data, and analyze government policy, and the future of friends with the ties in to join Nigeria Health Watch to be reporting from the community. Thank you so much, Mr. Ravi. Nice to have you on the panel. I have next uh, Mrs. Aisha Musa Ahmed. She's Aisha Musa Ahmed. Please, a round of applause for Madam Aisha Musa Ahmed. Madam Aisha Ahmed um, has over 19 years' experience as a clinician and public health practitioner. She holds diploma in community health uh, from School of Health Technology, MINA, and a BSc in Health Education, and a master's degree in Health Management. She is currently serving the Niger State uh, Basic Healthcare, I mean, the coordinator of the Niger State Basic Healthcare Provision Fund, BHCPF. Her responsibility includes ensuring proper implementation of the BHCPF in the state. She's a key team player. Um, who leads by building consensus among her team. She is passionate about developing people and is a good listener. As a person, she believes she holds the system provides sustainable development results. Once again, welcome. With Madam Aisha Ahmed, I have a full panel. And now I will hand everything over to the moderator, Mr. Alaboso. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Raul. You might you can share if it's not if it's not from here. Yeah. Thank you so much. And good morning again, everyone. So it's really a, uh, a pleasure to have you all join us here today in this learning 
opportunity. I'm sure you all understand why we are doing this now from the remarks that my colleague um, Dr. Kemi Sola gave and also what the EG's representative said. It's really about learning, you know, the, the holding on community voices. So you want to make a change. You don't sit in your office and decide, oh, this is what I need to change. It's important to hear from the people who are most affected and really not just affected, but also hear what they are doing. So you don't um, come in and think, oh, I have um, answers to all the problems. But here, if there are solutions that they have, see if there are ways to make those solutions better. So I'm really happy for the opportunity to moderate this really important um, panel. As far as rules go, we have 30 minutes for this, um, 30 minutes for the conversation. But again, because we keep saying it's about gearing, so it's a two-way conversation. It's not just us you know, putting it to our listeners, but also an opportunity to get feedback from you, questions and comments. So we'll have 20 minutes for that. So um, I'll just start by saying we all know the problem. Um, Amy also spoke a bit about that when she gave her remarks. We all know the problem, but we are here because we like to go beyond the problem. Yes. So that's the essence of this panel. How do we learn about what's being done already? What are those strategies? What are those um, processes that are being put in place? How are they working? So we're hearing from the BHCPF sectorate in Niger State, you know, what are those things that they are putting in place to make sure that people have access to basic health care? How is it translating to actual care in communities? So we hear from the OICs. And again, the community members who now assess this care, what is the experience like for them? We've seen some of the reports that we, the community report that we worked with, you know, got from the community um, engagement. But then we'll also be hearing from them directly, community reporter and also a WDC member, the secretary of um, the WDC. So without um, wasting much of our time, I'll dive right into it. Like I said, let's hear about some of those things that are being done. I'll start with you, Mrs. Aisha. You work at the, yes, and also the BSCBF secretary. So as far as that, um, policy goes or that strategy to make sure that people have access to basic health care. What is it supposed to do? Because you had the ED, you empower community members so they can demand. So they even need to know what the government has put in place. So what is it supposed to do? What is the best, what, what is in, in a simple term, what is the basic health care provision for now? What is it supposed to do as far as making sure people have access to quality health care? Um, okay. um, Okay. Once again, good morning, all. Okay, this is the daily of the um first and foremost, I really want to thank everybody for this opportunity given to me. My mentor, the teacher. Okay, thank you. Yes, I really want to use this opportunity given to me, my mentor, the teacher, and other colleagues. Actually, the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund is a program from the federal government. It's an initiative that has been brought to the state. It was a three state that was piloted first. Let me just start with the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund. It's a federal government initiative of Basic Healthcare Provision under the Section 11 of National Act 2014 as Catholic to provide service to PSC. At the, focal, at the facilities. So this is all about the healthcare provision fund. Actually, it's come a long way. We are, we are the three states that started this program in this year. The Abia, Oshu, and Niger State. Those are the three priority states that have been selected for this basic healthcare before the other remaining states join us. So far, so good, basic healthcare provision fund, that's, it has implemented a lot of, we really implement a lot of things in the in the state to the facility level, that is to the grass level. With basic health care provision fund, there is essential growth of commodity in the facility. There was a time I read to, because I do go through social media, that is in, through some, I mean, at um, Facebook, where I saw one of Justina Ashashi that she was talking about basic health care provision because she wanted to know more about basic health care provision fund. When she go through an assessment that 
There was a lady named Aisha Abida where she lost a child. Then maybe then before the implementation of the Zahe Care Provision Fund. And what really caused that issue was lack of drugs in the facilities and gaps of manpower. But with the implementation of basic health care provision fund, at least there's a lot of improvement in the facilities now. So, so far, so good. Medicine has made available at their price. There should be a full system of quality assurance to reduce the price of um, price of drugs. Now, with basic health care provision fund, there's essential drugs and community at the facility where all the focal facility made them compulsory to us that drugs. So that whenever a client should come to the facility, at least the first key, when a patient, when a healthcare should be able to see a client, at least that client should be able to get the medical attention, which is the drugs. So in our implementation at state, we have the disbursement that we do the facility, which is quarterly. This is how we start our program. When you get the funds, so we have this, the fund has been shared, I mean, has been given to facility, which is, that is, we call it DFF direct fund to the facility, which occur quarterly. And the Nike Gateway give capitation, which is monthly. You understand? So that capitation that is given is for them to carry out most of our activities in facilities. Why our home that we give to? Their own is, their, the Nike home is based on minimal package service and enrolled in, enroll in the facility. Why the MPCA Gateway, that is the state primary health care gateway, we are to carry the infrastructure, commodity, HRH services at the facility. So on our own gateway, I'm talking about my gateway now. That is under the state primary health care provision. I mean, under the state primary health care. We are, our own percentage is 45. So 25% goes down to the facility. That is the DFF. Why 20% goes down to the state? 10 for human resources, five, that is five, and we have five, we have HRH. That is 10 percent go to HRH, one for the midwives and one for the chiefs program. Then we have the we have for the sorry for the vaccine. Five percent goes the vaccine, uh, to the vaccine, where they procure vaccine to the facilities too. Where the state procure vaccine to the to the, to the LGA. Uh, the other 5% go for the for the maintainers and other consumable that we carry at the facilities. That means to the state. We have our own operation. We are with the other activities at the state. So under the HRH, we are able to recruit 200 skills that attended that is the midwives, which we engage into 274 for car facilities. Why the other 5% that we have, that is for the chiefs. We've made that we in that is we we they they they, they pay the stipend for the pay for the chiefs agent people and that is for their payments that is their own payment too that is the five percent for their payment why the five percent is, is the payment for the midwives so we also the with the payment that we made at the facilities level we make sure that the facilities people that is the facility got their money and purchase drugs at the facility do some minor repairment that is the renovation at the facilities level buy some equipment in the facility. There are also this capacity building for them to, to engage an adult staff. That is, they are only permitted to take and, I mean, they are only permitted to take security to safeguard the facility. That is the only privilege we are giving to them because but they, can't, they can't take more than that. Why there's, we, we do do monitoring and supervision to see how, Far they are utilizing how far they've gone with the, the utilization of the yeah. of the fund. So for the human resources too, we make sure that there is this continuity. Um, they, we, show, we ensure that there is this continuity, um, continuous availability of midwife to reduce the maternal and child mortality at the I mean at the facility at the community level, because those, that is the reason why we emphasize that most of those midwives have to be posted to focal facilities. And you know, you know, in time like this, that when you engage some midwives, they at the first when we make the advertisement for them to, we are doing. For, I mean, we made the advertisement that and they apply. Some of them we say they will take anywhere we take them, they will go. But at the end, at the end time, when we recruit them and post them, deploy them to their LGAs, some of them will come and start telling that they don't want to go to community. And in fact, 
it's not an easy task that we are, but we make sure that we stick to what we say that they have to go. If they are not going, then they have to just step down the appointment and we'll get those ones that are going we do. Yeah. Definitely, we have serials of people that came like that and we did that. And some of those midwives happen to be that some of them are in Florida, they have parents, they have people that maybe they have um, they have a godfather that you understand. But with that, with my director serials, we didn't allow that to work. And again, the another, because with the 200 that we include, we still know not, we are still not okay with the midwife because some of the facility, you can see that you can, if you go to other facilities, just maybe it's only one OIC, there's no even attender, you understand. So we make sure we engage all those midwives. And the Sudan is still has in, in recruit another midwife. In other cadres, we have the doctors, the midwives, the CHU, and the nurses. So they, they deploy them to the facility now, at least to increase more, at least to fill in the gaps of those staff, staff we yeah. have. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, uh -huh. still get that, but thanks for thanks for clearly painting you know, some of those strategies that the state is leveraging the basic healthcare provision for to improve access to services. You mentioned the drug, you mentioned the human resources part, and the chips. Um, I'm sure I don't know how many of us are familiar with the chips uh, program. Yes, community health employees and promoter services like program. Program. So, but just quickly before we go on to the, um, the OIC, I'm glad that you mentioned um, the Akada of um, health workers when you were when you were speaking. But in terms of awareness, how what are so what are some of the ways? Just, just one or two points, one one or two ways that you are making sure that community members are even aware because it's one thing to supply, but if people are yes. not demanding or coming for those, they'll just leave. Yes, one of the key, um, the, the key strategy we are using here is the WDC. You know, they are the key to the community. There's no way we can't do without them because those community are looking onto those WDC people because they are the voice of the community. So by the time we, we, we do, we, 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 we want to achieve any, anything that concerns health, we must involve the community, the stakeholder at the community at the grass level. So the community, that is WDC you know, stakeholders that we involve, most of them are playing their vital role. They, they are always doing their, they, they get that, they try and get that autonomy to their, because if they are on autonomy, they have to take the autonomy at the facility. Yeah, so ownership, yep, yeah. of your, their, their community. Um, so I'll go to you now, Mr. Hadiza. You are the officer in charge of the PHC, um, and you receive support as much as possible from the state. But as as the person in charge, what are some of the ways that you encourage people to come to the healthcare facility? What are some of the processes or strategies or things you put in place to make sure that your community, the people that you you serve, know what's available in the facility and also come to the facility to access those services? Thank you very much for that uh, question. Once again, good morning, everyone. All protocol duly observed. My name is Adiza Ahmed Bow, the OIC Department of Primary Health Care. Yes, regarding your question, sir, the way I put in place to see the demand of uh, people in the community to achieve health services is one, the opening time in the health facility was a very poor thing in my health facility. So when I was when I as in office in Papungu Primary Healthcare, I realized that the opening time was very poor. So we need to come together, had a meeting, and then put down put down my rules and regulations for opening time to be like uh, eight o'clock. Every healthcare provider should be on his seat, and then the uh, attendant also should be in place by 6 30 so that before 7 or 7 30 they are done with their activities ensuring that the environment is enabling for my clients and their patients and then uh what i did also was uh, or initiating was like um fumigating the environment because you see during this rainy season so many bushes around for using fumigation of the uh, uh, the chemical around the environment 
will really reduce the rate of uh, mosquito in the facility. From getting the wards also will reduce the rate of malaria uh, mosquito in the hospital. So also uh, the ensuring that uh, people in my community come to the facility to do, uh, to have their own services very important, and then ensuring that. Um, Initi initi uh, initiating also the the healthcare providers. Everybody must have his own responsibilities according to the to, to our unit because this is uh, integration component of all primary healthcare must be discharged uh, under the same roof and at the same time. So those at, in the lab should have their duty, and then those in OPD also to discharge their duty diagnose, take uh, and carry out, and then go to the lab for any diagnosis, whatever it is done, you treat according to our standing orders. I think that is... So what has the response been like, you know, putting all these strategies and plans in place? What has, has there been any change or you are still observing? What has it been like? Yes, at first, like uh, my... Coordinator, basic health provision, uh, healthcare fund has spoken. They've been really been supportive into our healthcare facility because with the uh, with the money that is being coming into the facility, we try to to solve so many problems and um, putting drugs into our dispensary, ensuring that the enrollees from Nike are really coming to access their services. And the, pro the challenge with the enrollees in the, with uh, NICA is like there is no full um, orientation. Nobody knows about that slip that is being given from the agency. No, uh, a few, like a few of them don't know. And then we try to call them one after the other to see that they come and access these services. Some will tell you that uh, they don't even they have the slip. And then the names again are not even correlating with what we have on the pay slip. And then doing that by doing that, uh, we are re we've really done a lot because in my facility, like I said, ensuring that or I initiated a good atmosphere environment or atmospheric environment was when I had meeting with them. They said no, uh, a staff cannot give birth in the labor room because of the unhygienic environment. But with the Nike and, and the basic health provision fund that was utilized, you go to my labor room now. In fact, last month, a staff from my facility delivered in the labor room, which is a good one. If my staff can come to the uh, labor room and deliver, women would achieve a lot. And then, yes, that is that. Is. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I like, um, you know, that. The final part of the note you ended, a staff yes. receiving care okay. in their own facility yeah, because facility. that's that's something we don't see a lot. I remember a conversation we had with um, Commissioner for Health in Enugu State. He said something that what really motivates him to do the work he does is because that healthcare they are working for is also the healthcare where they are supposed to assess healthcare. So if he has that that healthcare system rather, yeah. so if he has an emergency now. Maybe there won't be time to fly him abroad. So is that healthcare, that hospital in Enugu State? That's where they will rush him first. Yes, Maybe I consider it as an achievement. Step. Like yep. seriously, I was really happy when I had that. And then uh, other person also, like uh, I left her on Friday, being in the labor room also a staff, and then she delivered on Saturday morning. You see, we have two staff that access services in their own facility. facility. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Mr. Malam Hassan, you are the secretary of the World Health Development Committee. Can you share some of the ways you know, the WDC helps to increase demand, encourage people to know what's available, and also go to the facilities to assess healthcare? What roles, you know, the leadership that the WDC provide? how does it help with that? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. The chairman of this occasion, the permanent secretary here, 
other stakeholders, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the WDC, that is a World Health Development Committee. that was set up by the government for us to take care of the facilities. So it's a very good idea because we engage the government and community to do more on health. One, we do the community meeting, we do the community dialogues, we respond, we give feedback to the, to, the, uh, to the facility on the outcome of disease and other health care, and we give recommendations to government on what we see on health issues. In fact, we have a lot, a lot of challenges here and there, but uh, as stakeholders, we engage the uh, staffs and the facilities to do more. You know, sometimes in the facilities, you will have people that are not so much responsive on, on, on doing their jobs, who don't have, who have don't, uh, don't care attitude. So when we see those staff, we call them, we advise them, and ask them to do more. And uh, going back to the community level, we go around to teach some of us come and see our situations in the in the facilities to help. Like in my area now, there is one uh, good person, a retired soldier, that has spent about five hundred million naira reconstructing the clinic as a bit of matter in Chanchaga local government. This is a welcome idea for us to achieve and improve on, on health issues. Just as uh, Mrs. Oke has said, we know that uh, Niger State is not left behind on health issues, but still we, there are some challenges especially on the funds to do other little, little, little things in, the, in our facilities. And uh, another challenge is that um, we have uh,
members, the, the media to drive change, to improve basic health care. Please, basic. We're not talking about specialist health care. That's a conversation for another. Please, basic health care that people can access in their in PACs close to them. What are some of the ways that you are helping to, you know, have that synergy? Make sure that there's a synergy between these, these groups. And again, what's your commitment from this point going forward after this policy dialogue we're having today? Okay, actually, thank you so much for that. So far, so good for the way out. You know, we dispose money to the facilities. Uh, we make sure that money that has been spent to the facility be properly utilized. These are the key achievements that I think. Because you, you cannot imagine me sending money to the facility at the end of it, going to that facility is not achievable. It's still all your effort is wasted, you understand. And the life of those community at a risk. There was one incident that I went because we, we are in collaboration with the other agency that we always go out for sportive supervision. We do go out for supervision and supervision and the Nike, that is the major state control agency, go out for supportive supervision. So we work in synergy that we have to go out and find out all the gaps that are there so that when we go back, we do, we do have the briefing where everybody talk about what is find out in the facility, whatever that person find out in the facility for a way forward. So actually there was a time I go to the facility for its permission, that is in Kacha local government in Edosu. I met a beautiful, a fine facility that was constructed, but there was not, it was, okay, I, sorry, I didn't even meet the OIC there. We have to wait for him to come down and meet us where we go, went for all the supervision that we're supposed to do. And on our conversation with the OIC, I was not telling you, you have a beautiful facility, but I don't think you are utilizing it the way it's supposed to be. Because if uh, you, at least, I will manage this facility that everybody will come and make referral with the facility. So, you know, when you go out for supervision, or you go, it happens that you go out for supervision, you see anything that is not doing well, at least you, you initiate, you tell that person, that is, you mentor that person for a way forward. So I have to ask him that you have a facility, you're talking that you don't have enough bed. When in that facility, you have boys' quarter and you are not living in that boys' quarter. You have two rooms in that boys' quarters that you, that you are given, but you are not staying because you are a member of that facility. So what I told him is that, why not those two rooms that you have at the boys' quarter, one you make it to be a male ward, one should be a female ward. Why the generator, because they have another room, I mean, a generator room where they was kept, there was nothing. I said, if I were you, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you innovation. That is how we do our innovation by thinking fast. This generator room, since there's not any generator and you're not using it, why not turn that place to be a level room? Please, you understand? Then the gate room, they have another room for the gate man and there's not any gate man. Make this place to be a lab. You understand? And the man was not thinking, yes, I just say, this is how you're supposed to do, and this is how you in, improve your community because this is your community. They are looking into you. Those children that, you know, we have some graduates that are there. We know we have problem of uh, staffing in the you know, staff, remember, moms, um, gaps of manpower in the, in the, in the state, all this one. But my advice, since we do have money from the capitation that you have, this is how you innovate other children. Since you have some children that finished their graduate from school of health, nursing, midwife, bring them in. This is how you help them. You, this is the glory is not going to be from them, but it's going to be from you. Whenever they come, the facility is alive and the people are patronizing it. But you just kept the facility like that. You are saying there's no staff. And the way the facility, the instruction, I mean, the structure of that facility is well built, but you are not utilizing it. So that is how I was trying to bring that initiative to that man. And he took it and he said, yeah, next time if you come seriously, you're going to see a change in that facility. So you understand. So in our own part, we make sure that we play our own vital role. Anytime we go out for supervision, we see anything that is not doing well, we make sure that they put it in order. You understand. So the other last time, because we do have some quality assessment that we do quarterly. We had last, that was last quarter. So all the report has been sent to us where all the gaps has been there. So we make sure that at the debriefing meeting, we try and utilize that gap. We need to make sure to, fit into, to fix into that gap that all those issues that have been discussed should be resolved. And we make sure that all the directors in primary, if there's any, any information that we want to pass, 
By the time I touch my director, I make sure the director and the PSC, because they are the director, they are the overseer and the facility. When they come to the facility, they come to the LGA, they are the first contact they will be first, they will meet before the OIC. So to make sure that things are work in the same way so that we achieve that same goal that we want. You understand? Thank you very much. Uh, so I hope you also continue doing that, working in synergy with the facilities and the WTC. And again, take the reports that you know from the communities and put them into um, action and you are you know, bringing up strategies to improve. Thank you very much. Um, so as far as the, the WTC goes, um, so going, going forward from here, you work with government at least to an extent, but from your own experience, how do you think that relationship can be strengthened? They are here listening to you, you have the representative of the ED, you have um, someone from the primary healthcare board and also the B overseas, the BAC, PF sector. So from those challenges that you have in the community, how do you think you can work together? You are speaking to them directly now and also the media because they will help put out whatever you are saying. What are the ways you think you know, we can strengthen that relationship so that there will be more accountability at the primary healthcare level? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, even we in the WDC, we have made uh, recommendations. As we want government to engage us very well, we even wrote a letter to the primary healthcare agency that they should be up and doing. The NGOs are trying, but the primary healthcare, they, 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 they need a lot to do for us. We want them to be engaging us all the time, to be having meetings so that we, we rob minds. We tell them our problem. But since about two years ago now, we don't have anything to do with uh, uh, primary healthcare agency. They only deal with the local government uh, director. So, and the, the director from the local, the local government cannot do enough. So even the challenges we are having from the facilities is uh, with the staffs. From what we understand from our own end, there are there is a lot of challenges from the staff with their with their dealings with the patients. So the the problem we we normally have is um, we with the staffs are not. Uh, they are not uh, the, their relation with, uh, with with the patients is not is not good. They don't have human relation. Yes, they don't have re a human relation. That is first. Secondly, uh, they are, they don't have passion on their on their work. Uh, you see this work. The community is their own. The people is their own. So I don't know. I see no reason why. They should not be up and doing in carrying out their their duties for 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 them to to contribute towards the development of their their people and their society. So and uh, about the this uh, our this uh, feedback feedback with the with the local government and the agency, we were told that uh, we have somebody who will be supervising the WDC whenever we have meetings. But we did a meeting now, about a year ago, we didn't see anybody. It's surprising. So the government is showing us accusing fingers that they, like, they, don't, they, are, they are removing their hand from the health issue. But uh, their hand is, uh, we know, cannot be removed like that. This part that we have the NGOs trying their best, at least the NGOs, whenever they have program, they will call us and train, train us. Tell them what they, are, they, what, what they want to do for us. But the government is not doing that. So, Hadia, please, you are the representative of the government here. So we want to please to go out there and tell the, the government to do more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam I think that was very clear request better engagement and it's really good to see that you have your eyes in 
you know what's happening in your communities you know the issue so that means you are you are really involved thank you so much but my own suggestion there is also our request is to ask if you work as a coalition so what you said now is it going as you know a wdc from say Wushishi to the local government or um, to the primary care board or it would be good if you have work as a group to all the wdc so you have a stronger voice and you know whatever you, whatever request you are sending but yes thank you so much um, for that I'll go to Madam. Okay, so finally, you are hearing what you know what the government is committing to at, at least to an extent. You are hearing what the challenges are. So also for you as the person in charge um, of the facility, how do you think? Just simply because we're also running short on time, so we can get on to the second one. So what do you think can be done to improve these relationships? And also what are you committing to from now going forward? After this point. Thank you very much. Improving the health facility or flow in the health facility will be really, we really need this full support of or full implementation of the chief's agents in the facility. Because these chief's agents are the link between the community and the facility, where they mobilize, they give prophylaxis, and then they uh, refer uh, clients or patients from the community to the facility. And then you see these chiefs, they tend to have some like uh, deficiencies because they tend to have inadequate uh, transport allowance, inadequate uh, stipends that are supposed to be given to them. And then it's supposed to be like um, at the end of the month, both the chief's agent, either the OIC and the chief's agent and the supervising chief's agent should have a maybe an evaluation at the end or review meeting at the end of the day where if there's any lapses, they correct and stuff like that. But you see that don't take place in which the problem from in the community, like the, the, the delivery at home, you see it's higher in the home than the facility. They are supposed to be, be, be a link because all these incentives are not there, we should be motivating them. If we're motivating them at the end of the year, maybe quarterly, eh, uh, there should be reward and sanction. When they, uh, the other colleagues see that the person, this person is really carrying out his own duty uh, judiciously and he's being rewarded according to what he does, there will be really most to other people. Thank you so much. Um for sharing that. So finally, Rabbi, as someone who is seeing all of this, you know, happening, documenting, um, investigating, reporting, what are you going to do to make sure that there are more people, more community reporters, really, because you can't be everywhere all the time. So imagine there are 50 of you. Imagine there are 100 of you supporting the WDCs, you know, to see what's happening and also reporting those, investigating what's reporting, finding out what's working well, what's not working and you know, amplifying all of those. How are you going to do that? And what other things are you committing to, be, to, to do as a community reporter to make sure that there is more accountability and more people know what they should get at the community level so they can demand or request or ask for them? Thank you very much. From my uncle, uncle, I think there is need to create synergy between the media, primary health care agency, and basic health care provisional fund, so that any supervision that they are going to, they need to involve media. There is need for that. Because if I, mom, there is one primary health care that I visited at Barwa, Barwa Primary Health Care, Ushishi, where I have seen a lot. They have did a lot with that basic health care provisional fund. They build toilet facilities. They buy drugs. That drugs, that is what they used to do. They used to revolved 
they paid their security from that basic healthcare provisional fund, and they even demarcate a lab in that primary healthcare, which there is need if you want to pay a visit to any primary healthcare, you need to involve media so that the masses or the, the government will know that, okay, this is what is going on. Secondly, primary healthcare centers should allow media easy access to carry out their duties efficiently. Because most of the times in Ushishi, from my own community, they are scared to speak out. They are scared, always. Before they allow me access to that place, I have, they have to call the director. Are you the one that allows also person to come? So I'm calling on the ED, the BSCF, the BSCB, to inform those directors in various local government that, okay, social organizations are carrying out social things. We are not there to dent or spoil the image of anyone. We are there for the benefit of masses, the rural dwellers. And there is need for the BSCF to expand, to expand their role, to expand their the funding to other primary health care centers. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And uh, while doing that, also, like I asked earlier, see ways you can build up other community reporters to support you, encourage them, people you know who are influential, youth leaders, they can be your, um, your sources, yeah, to help you have eyes in, you know, in all those places. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for being amazing. Um, participants by listening attentively. We'll now take questions, but before we go, we have wow. I just want to respond to this. I don't know how much time. So they are controlling that. But we have one response from from one of the panelists here. Yes, sir. So sorry for the response of my uh, the WDC representative. Actually, for the engagement of the WDC that you are saying we should engage them, we've started. I don't know if you are among the people that are invited this year, but I know actually I've started engaging the WDC. They are part of my activities that I have to carry because we need to move forward. So I've started and it is continuous. So we're glad that we're able to bring you to. So if there's any, if you don't have con his contact, maybe he, you missed inviting him. We're glad we have convened this. So this is an opportunity to network and. Um, continue doing the amazing work you're doing. So please, as you ask um, briefly, if it's a question, briefly, just straight to the question, you mentioned the person you want to respond to it. If it's a comment, also briefly, so we can uh, wrap up for the day. Thank you so much. And my colleague will be in charge of that. I don't want anybody to be yes, so, so, um, <laughs> yes. We decide so who wants to give brief, the like, mic. Just who, balance like, like Take three questions, I think. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's take yes. four. So we have two male and two females, right? One, two, three, four. Wow. <laughs> All right, I will do. Okay, you one, of course. And I have two. I think we have a representative in this table. So we have two here. All right, so we'll see to that. So we have three, and then we have four. Opportunity to also engage with during lunch or after the event. All right. So I've been instructed that we should give everyone a chance, but it's going to be brief. So yes. So maybe if we're giving the money, start with my. It would be good to also count it now, so someone doesn't get inspired to get another. Yes. So, so just count how many people want. So you are one. You are two, three, four. Five, please. All right, six. Ma, you are seven. 
You are eight, please. So this is, is that you are nine? yeah. Thanks, Kevin, for that. You are yes. We are saying community voices, so it's good to hear. So you are eleven. To say. So you are twelve. Let's try and make it brief because we have quite. Oh, a... you are thirteen. So I I hope everyone can be able to keep this very brief. Yes. Also to make it, also to make it short. Father is if you hear somebody asking your question, please don't repeat it. Just let the next person to answer. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Atori. I'm from the media. I want to commend the panelists for it all well done. However, I have a few comments and uh, questions. The first is to my constituency. Um, some years back, I went to Shish local government. I did report on May 2 facility. That uh, facility drew the attention of the government. You know? And what happened that time, it's not just getting the negative parts aspect of uh, things. You need to do a follow-up. And one thing that helped us that time was the establishment or the creation of a citizen journalist. I think a White Ribbon Alliance, they were very, very uh, helpful at that time. So our media guy, you need to also work with the mainstream media in Niger State. Because what we're doing at that time, we have citizen journalists stationed in various local government areas. And when they get information, they should not just go and publish and you have gotten information. You need to balance your report. You need to get those who have been in the field. We try as much as possible, those of us in the mainstream media to guide you. And I also want to correct an impression. Those of us in the mainstream media will have access to these facilities. If any of my colleagues reach out to me, that they want to go to any facility, the first thing I do, I go to the ED. They have their media units there. There is no time we were denied. You probably didn't um, take advantage of all the channels you needed to. So that will uh, guide, so that we don't go on criticizing uh, unnecessarily. So to Another thing, I think there is a contradiction here. When the ED was speaking, not Dr. Genedu, he uh, mentioned, he talked about the facilities across the, uh, the state around um, 74 years. And that we have midwife, at least one midwife in all these facilities. I just want us to get things straight because we have some of uh, the panelists who are saying some workers, including midwives, don't like going to these facilities. So we need to get things right. If we're getting from the policy maker or the, the ED for instance, saying the air workers, they're all stationed in these facilities and we have uh, those who are staff there contradicting what uh, the ED has said that there's a problem. It now creates room for uh, suspicion and for us to carry out investigation. And I want to say this, um, Facilities in 274 wards. How many of these facilities, be honest, Mark, how many of these facilities are functional? Are functioning, sorry. Yes, how many of them are functioning? Because we know we have, um, um, it's, what is it called now? You see a focal, that you started with some to see how they go. How many? Because when you say you have, midwives in all these facilities, it means they are working, they're all working. So you need to tell us, because I'm from the media, I don't want to be to do a report where I will not be held responsible for, it's gone? Yes. I wanted to, I have like two more. Okay, let me just leave it here. I'm sure other people will. Can I respond? Can I continue? Okay, let me just allow people. Who is the second person to please? So, oh, good afternoon, everyone. 
Mm -hmm. I have some observations, and uh, one of which is that um, the basic healthcare provision fund is not only going through the primary care development agency. That in the states there are different gateways that um, the basic care provision fund is going to. So um, state primary care development agency is just one of the gateways. We also have the um, Niger State um, Contributory Health Agency gateway, which also disposes money to the PHCs in form of computation. And um, I thought that um, for this to have happened, uh, we should have had this pre-interaction before this meeting. So that's just to just bring our notice that um, some funding is going through the state um, contributory health agency gateway, and that's what they keep referring to as NICA. So the perception is that there's a NICA program different, and there's a BHCPF program different, and even. On one of the pages on this um, magazine I've, I've looked at, also says Nike and BHCPF. It is the same thing. Nike only discusses the computation for number of beneficiaries who are getting care from the health facilities. And throughout the state, currently we have over 50,000 of this vulnerable population that has been enrolled by Nike to access healthcare at the PHC level. And then since 2021, this uh, capitation has been paid to these uh, health facilities for care for these 50, over 50,000 people. And then the, one of the panelists talked about the expansion. And this year, Nike is going to expand enrollment to additional um, 29,000 enrollees who will be going to these health facilities. And additional enrollment means more funding to the health facility because for each of the beneficiaries under the health facilities, a certain amount of money is paid on their behalf monthly for basic minimum package of health services. And for secondary care, if it goes beyond the health facility, they can also, the primary health care facility, they can also refer to the secondary health care facility and the bills will be paid by Thank you. Thank you. So much for making that clarification. Who is three? Okay. So good morning, all. I want to stand on the existing protocol. I want to talk about taking off ownership. There's this new course that the Nursing and Midwifery Council introduced, Community Midwifery. How do they get admission? Forms are sent to local governments so that the chairman picks someone from the community and then sends them to the school where there's an interview and they'll be enrolled and the uh, local government will sponsor them through the studies. But from what has been happening, local government will collect the form, probably send somebody their relations in the city and sometimes come to the school, there will not be sponsorship. It is the parents that will then, then sponsor their Words and at the end of the day, they will refuse to go back to the community to work. So I believe if the local government, the government or the national agency can maybe uh, add a voice so that this set of uh, midwives are uh, brought to the school to come and learn from the community, they will definitely go back to their community and then function better. Thank you. Front. Uh, quickly, Abakaya, also traditional institution, religious uh, institution. I'm wearing two caps. The media man here has, you know, clarified one area which I wanted to ask the media about synergy. Uh, what we keep hearing lack of manpower, lack of manpower, and the manpowers are available, and the manpowers are not being utilized. So now, to me, bad leadership is just our major problem in this country. The experienced people are there, but we lack good leadership. There are three sectors. Even if the government is going to concentrate on these three sectors, 
we are good to go. Education, security, and health. But every time security we say lack of manpower, education we say lack of manpower, health we say lack of manpower. All these budgetary uh, provisions made for these three key ministries, where does all this money go to? No accountability, there's nothing going on. In fact, I want to say a very, very big thank you and congratulations to our primary health care centers. They are doing their best. We at the community, in fact, most of us now don't even know where the general hospital is situated. We use our primary health centers and they are doing wonderfully well. But the problem here is this, the drugs, the primary health centers are all scaring us away because of the high cost of drugs. You find out that when you go to primary health center, the bill given to you, there is no differences than you going to a private uh, uh, clinic or health facility. So I feel they need to look into that area of you know, seeing how they can subsidize their drugs or their treatments so that they can have this, uh, people will have this confidence of coming uh, around. And then the area of supervision. I was in the primary health center, and what did I get to know? Soon she has asked me, why, is the, why are the officials of the primary health informing their staff that they are coming? And that's when they begin to get prepared. There should be on spot assessment visits where you go and see things to yourself. And then communication gap, which the man from the community has spoken. You will get a, a, a health worker in the clinic. And what did she do? Or what did he do? Social media. Hello, he's pressing his phone. He's chatting. He's on Facebook. No, you get you know annoyed to the extent that you leave the uh, facility. Then finally, all cannot be bad. We have a primary health center in Busso, that's central. Also central one, which was newly built. <laughs> a new building, but when you go in there, I don't know, I don't know how to call it. A broken table and bench from the old facility is when they moved again into the new facility. I don't know. And when we went to see the last commissioner of health, which is Mapu City, I nearly got angry with him. Because the answer that comes from him to us was not encouraging. That's why I said we have bad leaders placed in the, in the very strategic places where we don't need them. So our prayers as religious council is to pray that God Almighty provide us with good leaders. And everything will find its way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sas, uh, for sharing. And please, I would like us to be like maintaining try to see what we can in one minute so that everyone can have, and then we have the next session. Who is the next person? Thank you very much, um, the panelists. Um, first of all, I would like to know how many people are registered under the basic healthcare provision fund in Niger State, since Niger happens to be one of the three piloting states in Nigeria. Now, sec, uh, my next question is just for what are we doing to improve quality um, service delivery in Niger State. That's to improve uh, maternal, newborn, and child health in the, in the state because it's two, as in one in 95 women is, is huge. Then there's what we call ramp cap plus N. I'm, I'm surprised I'm not seeing it in any of your, in any of, um, this we have here today. So what are you doing around Ramka plus N? And um, sometime last day we added the elderly too. So just tell us uh, what um, Niger State is doing around this. Thank you. Thank you so much, okay. Your next one too. No yeah, good morning all. My name is Felix uh, Igma. Mine is just to to commend uh, the Nigerian Health Watch for this uh, laudable initiative of uh, community reporting. I remember some time back, I, I was part of this initiative 
Uh, if you see this uh, young man here, I actually recruited all of them. We started in uh, Ushishi, Paikoro, and uh, uh, Baku uh, local government. And uh, from what he has presented today, I think this initiative that actually has actually helped that has gone a long way to open the eyes of uh, even the, the policymakers to what is happening in the interior communities. You know, sometimes they are in the city, uh, they may not have a first-hand information of everything that is going on there. But with this that uh, is happening today, they always have this information of uh, the status of our facilities, just as they always report. I learned that uh, they have expanded up to, I think, eight uh, LGs at the moment. I, I don't have that exact figure, but I want to plead that uh, since this initiative is a good one, it's bringing up uh, uh, to the fore some of these facilities that are not in a good shape for government to also see how they can, you know, pull resources there to put them to use. I think there will be need for expansion, you know, if the government can partner with uh, the Nigerian Health Watch in expanding this initiative to cover the 25 LGs, I think it will go a long way to bring uh, to the fore all of these facilities that are dilapidated so that something can be done about them. I example, they can, if the resources are not available there, they can leverage on the existing uh, volunteers we have, like the chief agents, as they are working in certain facilities. If they find out that this facility is not in good shape, they can bring it to the table. They say, okay, this facility did this and this and this, so that uh, we don't talk about uh, legal resources because they are not available to train more, uh, community reporters to go uh, bring up all of this report. So that's my take. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you, Mr. Felix. So I think we'll take one, then we can take a lot of Yes, yes yeah. to respond. Yeah, so it doesn't get too, too long. I'll take the last batch. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Thank you for a well, uh, job well done, the panelists. I'm Dr. Mogaji Aminu, the chairman of the state's MPSRS committee. I frantically was asking for a slot to ask a question or make a comment because I felt the discussion is about MPSR. And we must get um, the technicality right. Let me go straight to my questions or comments. One is to the media. The first time you are talking, you are talking about those things that you are able to unearth from the primary health care centers you have visited that were not correct. And at a point, you was trying to say, it's very good that you are bringing those things, but that uh, it's not all about negative. It is very cardinal. We have media on our side, the MPDSR Implication for Health Implementation Committee, to have the media on our side. And we have to tell the media to repurpose, even if they are doing investigative journalism, to repurpose for the achievement of MPDSR that the heartbeat of accountability of maternal death is no blame, no shame. You don't name the person or a person who you think has caused the death of the woman. Or you blame somebody for the death of the woman. If that is taken away, we will never achieve accountability in maternal death. Caught me. I have experienced it as the chairman of the NPS. So we have. In, um, uh, in one of our retraining, after a little implementation of this strategy, we had to invite the NBA that they should be aware that even if it's a legal issue, it's a litigation for death, for maternal death, it is only the courts that is allowed the name or the question or the sum of somebody who is unless you have committed a mistake that led to the death of this one. The reason is that every day sir, is in the spirit of what happened in Europe about maternal accountability. That's confidential inquiry into maternal death. They had, after the post-World War, 
they had invented antibiotics, embedded an anesthesia that helped ward infections and transfusions that had been killing women. So they reached a point where, yes, the maternal death has never come down from there. And then they questioned themselves. That's when they came about confidential inquiry into maternal death, where you don't ever name any mistake, somebody who could commit a mistake or blame somebody who commits a mistake. Because of that, Sweden, uh, Netherlands, have changed the definition of maternal mortality ratio to not per annum. They've changed it to in, in one year, which how many women died of maternal death or maternal cause? They didn't get any. So they had to shift their own definition to every five years before they could get a one maternal death. And we're talking about the United States, what are our figures? It's about a thousand. So it is very important. This is not, let me say, I'm using the opportunity as uh, the uh, privileged panelists in the next panel to say this thing. Maybe I will not have the time that no blame and no shame. Sorry, no, no blame and no name is very, very key. Otherwise, things will get to be buried each time we are reviewing this death. And because of that, Nothing, you can never get to the root. So please, I think that when News Watch, sorry, Health Watch is making advocacy and recommendation, you should say so that the media should part of, should be part of uh, 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 this uh, new idea of strengthening um, accountability of maternal death so that, you see, it, it, the politicians are so scared of media, okay? Nobody knows a woman dies every day in the, in the hospital until when a media picks somebody who is very important, or it's not even important, the media picks somebody who apparently was responsible for the death of this one, they'll put it on the paper, wow. And then the political leaders will come for your friend. They will send the MD party. They will say, sack this and sat down, and nothing gets done. Stu, let me talk to the WC. I think we will have more time. Okay. Please, sir, let me, let, please, sir, sorry, sorry. I take it out of the time I will spend, because the WC, what also mitigates the practice of MPDSI is communication up and communication down. And that's what we have said. You sit down with your doctors. I, 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 I preside in the hospital where we had 21 doctors. Today, we have only seven. I, apart from the work, I forced them to let us review any death that have, that have occurred. And then after review, they asked me, what comes from that? We have communicated, OK, we notify 10 people died this month, or five people died this month. These are what we found as reasons or contributory factors. And then nothing comes from up down. If you don't come, if you, by way of action, when the government or policymakers or leaders do not respond to what has been recommended, that is the number one killer of your morale. And that kills the NPDS and uh, something. The third one is about NICA. NICA, NICA just said it is financial, health finances is very important. NPDS has strengthened it has to consider that people pay from pocket. People who buy insurance or general taxation pay for health, or if you have oil, you pay for health. Somebody pays for health. 80% of our community, well, our people pay from their pockets. And whether we like it or not, ignorance and, and, and poverty plays a role in people dying. Forget any other. We, we, we are very good clinicians. That's why. The, the first one point of call for, for people outside who wants any country is Nigeria. So we are seeing that 80% of our population are just a medical bill away from poorly into poverty. For those who are surviving, let them just have, you know, to take one of their wives to the hospital. If they were able to feed themselves, you find that they would go borrowing. 
to be able to feed themselves because they would have spent the money they had in taking care of this. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Man. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry to have taken much of your time this way, but you can have a few minutes to respond to some, and then we can move on to the next panel. Okay, thank you so much. For the first question, the, it was talking about the, the deployment of midwives that we that actually say I did. Actually, you know, we deployed midwives to two seven, we deployed 200 midwives to focal facilities, you know? At first, don't get me, don't misquote me. You know, my directors thought that we deployed midwife to all facilities, which actually we did that. But you know, you cannot serve everybody. No matter how you try to do your best, I'm not saying that they didn't go to the facility. Those that refuse to go, we replace them with those that are willing to go to the facility. So all my 200 midwives are fully engaged in the focal facilities. Get me to facilities, it's focal facilities. No, I just say I said focal facilities. Okay. I said focal facilities. <laughs> yes, yes. I deployed to two <laughs> to the focal facilities. All right. So sorry for the lack. Okay, you want to say something? Let me just Dr. we're really running out of time. <laughs> I'm I'm being very careful. I do, sorry, I'm being very careful when I have media people, leave them. They are my very good friend, but then we need to sort it. Now look at it. We have three arms that bring midwife into the system. We have the basic healthcare provision fund that brings 200. They didn't get it, get that right. Now we have the national primary healthcare that brings another 88. This one, it mixes with Jews, JHU, nurses, midwife, doctors, three doctors. This is another set. Now, there is another set again that coming under Gabi, Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative. They've taken about 250. They are all choose, J choose, nurse, midwives. Did you get that? Now, what we did is for each facility, you have a minimum at least one. No, chips is not a bad yeah, thing. So what we did out of all this we have is for us to ensure that each of the facility has at least one midwife. Now, look at how we did. When she did her own, we look at when uh, Gabby did their own, we run through the Excel, duplicate, we remove them, and then we did the other one. The essence is to have one. However, however, please get it right. There are some places for now in Mina. There are no good area in the justice. Let's be realistic about that. Good. So what we did was people in that community for that world, we ensure that we have an extra in some of the city around so that once the peace restore in those ones, we push them. So while in paper, that is what they're supposed to be. In practice, we don't reach them. So we keep them very close, but within that locality, that we can only redistribute. And that's why we authoritatively say each FOCA, quote me right, each FOCA 274 have at least one. Thank you. So elaborative. Thank you so much. Um, are you still responding? <laughs> So yes, okay, yeah, done that. Right. So we have the vice if she wants to respond to something. Please, in one minute, if you can. Okay, thank you very much. I want to talk on the high cost of price that the gentleman spoke about in the health facility. In the primary health care facility, we don't run drug space on our own. We have DRF, we have from Central Medical Store where they bring these drugs to the facility. And the last drugs they brought from the primary um, local government, which is the DRF that we're running, was really, really high. Because compared to what is in the market, and we don't know where they got that their own prices from, because the reposition, the prices, everything is there. So when we complained to our director, she said we should just take care of that. And then you see, and then definitely it has to affect the community, definitely in one way or the other. And the next question who said, um, how do we improve maternal and child health in our community? It's uh, number one, like by telemedicine, through phones and computer, because we are now in the digital world, either we like it or not, we get there. So by providing computers and phones you're in, at your home, in your office, where you, if we, we need to create an app for healthcare provider and that of our customer. And then you'll be online and then you charge, you refer whatever is your complaint and the healthcare provider attended to you, being it ANC, being family planning and all 
that. The next is maybe collaboration between the traditional bed attendant. When we have this um, uh, understanding between the two of us, where they know what they cannot do at home, that should be referred to the health facility immediately. That will reduce the maternal and mortality rate in the community. And also outreach services. When we go through outreach services, where facility needs to help educate women based on the benefits of ANC, the benefits of delivery at school and at, in the facility, that will really help and then reduce the rate of maternal and mortality rate in the community. Then through the use of uh, uh, students, midwives, students from School of Health Technology that uh, are graduates and don't have any work to do, then the community, they cannot refer uh, patient uh, from the community to the facility. And again, from the tips agents, like I said, there are a link between us and the community. Thank you. Thank you so much for those responses. And please, a good round of applause for my panelists. And um, the participants, thank you also, even though you hijacked our, our session. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks for those insights. Um, yes, that's that's the end of this first panel. So just take a picture, sir. Please. Yes, please. We are going to have a good picture. picture. Uh, Kemi, please. Make way for the next panel yeah, so. to kick off. Thank you so much. So please, you can ask that. Okay. Now, the, the panelists, the panelists, please. Just the panelists. Baba? Okay, just the panelists. Yes, please. We would have loved to accommodate everyone, but yeah. the time. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we are now moving on to the second panel session, which is going to be moderated by my colleague, um, Sophia Shaibus, is a senior communication officer at the Nigerian Health Watch. Please, a round of applause for Sophia. So because of time, I might likely not be able to read out uh, some bias. So one of uh, our panelists is, of course, as we said earlier, Dr. Aminu Magaji, the state MPC DRS uh, committee chairman, Dr. Magaji. Please, a round of applause for Dr. Magaji. Even though that was not part of his uh, session, but he has given us a lot, maybe. <laughs> uh, we don't know what we're going to get this time around. So the next is uh, Dr. Inua Junaidu, Director HPRS, United States Primary Healthcare. Please, a round of applause to Dr. Junaidu. We have Madam Mary Bauer, uh, a community delegate. Ma, you're welcome. Yes, please. Please, a round of applause for Mama as she goes to the stage. Thank you, Mom. Last but not least, uh, Mr. Matthew Oladeli uh, from the Initiative for Social Development in Africa, ISODAF. Welcome, Mr. Matthew. Of course, I'm not going to take much of your time. And Sophia, before I give it over to you. So um, if you're here, I know most of us are on social media. Um, I should have told you this earlier. So if you're on Twitter, we have a hashtag. Uh, hashtag PHC for all. That is the hashtag we use to drive this communication on Twitter and Facebook. If you're there, please. You can take a photo of yourself or then with you and the next person sitting to you, tweet it with this hashtag. I'll get all of us there. Thank you so much. Sophia, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Bao. Uh, good distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you. 
my wonderful being um, got a introduction. Got a very good introduction to this. Um, Thank you. Um, improving um, maternal um, survival, ch um, child survival, and ensuring accountability really lies at the heart of this um, policy dialogue. We've heard the statistics. They've not been very good for our ears. And we've seen how the discussion has already um, evolved. And we can see the passions already rising for a change. Um, so. Dr. Magaji, I'm going to start with you. Um, no need for any more introduction. <laughs> and you've already set a very good um, tone for the MPDSR discussion. But um, I'd like to ask currently, how is um, the quality of maternal health care accountability maintained at the state and sub-national level in Niger? Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, maternal and perinatal death, surveillance and response is actually one of the strategy that is adopted to account for maternal death. Right before this time, some people are able to count how many deaths they have when a woman goes to deliver but they never account for it. They'll just count 10, 10 women died three, two more, well, last month. Last year, 300 died from childbirth, but nobody actually accounts for them. Nobody sits down and analyzes what the problem is and how can we prevent this? And that's why the MPDS are coming to be. And I just said that is how it's been. The only form of um, Accounting for maternal death is at the facility level where we are doing maternal reviews. Okay, uh, this this year our statistics show this month that three women died. What caused their death? We we'll see that among doctors and nurses, we we'll do. Oh, it was this person's fault. You supposed to have done this. You shouldn't have done that, and so on. And then life goes on. No recommendations. No actions. Nobody to take a uh, responsibility, and that's how when, until when MPDSR comes, and then MPDSR provided a platform. Okay, train headquarters and said, okay, this is new way of trying to account for women who die while giving birth. So come for some training. Here are tools you worked with. These are the questions that are critical to ask that will bring out what's really caused the death of this woman. We know them. But most importantly, those contribution factors, because direct causes of maternal death is worldwide. Sepsis, bleeding, let me use the common terms, convulsions, um, obstructed level. It's known worldwide. These are direct causes of maternal death. But things are not as bad as it is in our own clan because of the contributory factors. So MPDSR have been able to give us the skill to bring out those contributory factors. And the contributory factors, and of course, number one will be at the clinical skills that is provided, services that is provided, and then the patient's uh, contributory factors, the family's contributory factors, the community's contributory factors. So, if you have a maternal death, we're looking at contributory factors. You realize that seventy percent of death are caused by contributory factors. If you look at seventy percent of eighty uh, percent of those contributory factors, they occur at the community level. Okay, so. We have been able to our primary and um, secondary healthcare facilities to first of all establish that uh, way of accounting for maternal death 
through NPBSR, we have been able to train 22 health facilities and then ask them to start uh, accountability through NPBSR. That is when we started having the numbers that died. That is why, how we started um, seeing those contributory factors. And believe you me, they are almost repetitive. Very clear that even though the death of co health facilities, 80% of contributory factors come from the community. So um, we have been also been able to say quarterly meeting. And at quarterly meeting, we collect all those analysis of maternal death at health facilities by the MPDSR committee, and then send their recommendations based on what they have found. And those recommendations are taken to the state level where we have quarterly meetings four times in a year that you review these recommendations and this finding and see which actions you know, we can take so far. It's a strong culture of now trying to account for mothers that die. It's no longer counting on numbers and not accounting for them. And um, we are getting to escalate it, you know, it's like communication of, yes, women died and then it's analyzed, it's sent up to the level of arms, to the level of commissioners, and then at the quarterly meeting, we come and review those things, what will the facilities do, or what can the facilities do, what can government do, and all through this, like I told 70% of the contributing factors are in the communities, and they are not on that NPDSR platform. So that is why I am excited that Newswatch decided to say that let's have this policy dialogue that will address that kind of NPDSR, the community accounting for the death of women that goes to give birth. Thank you. Let me hear so much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, very insightful and um, well said. Um, Madam Mary, come to you because um, a lot of what Dr. Magaji has said is actually um, where I believe you're going to throw more, more light. Um, Madam Mary um, is a healthcare practitioner although retired, but I don't know if you can ever retire from taking care of people and providing help. So, I mean, this is wonderful that we have your insight as someone who has been on this side and is now on this side. Um, Dr. Magaji has said that 70 to 80% contributory factors of this mortality is from the community. Ma, can we have your view on this? I think it's okay. Thank you. I have a prior here. During the days of Professor Ansomkuti, who was Nigerian's health minister in the 80s to the early 90s, primary health care services to the community were implemented with the full buy-in, buy-in of the community. We have seen we have come a long way from the days of Ransomkuti, and I am aware of new trains in establishing service delivery points at the community level. However, my assessment of our situation in Ninja State today is that there is the need for us to retrace our steps and rediscover some of these strategies that work today. After all, it is all about evidence-based or what works, whether it is old fashion or not. So in this vein, we all know the importance of the community in the care of healthcare services. Since here, we have identified that yeah, I mean, without a demand, demand for the services of the 
emanate from the community. The services are from the community. Let's say, for instance, we are community members, and it's my own health that is in my hands. So when I think the mistake we make as self-care providers, including the government members, is we don't give enough finding or we don't create enough finding of the community when establishing even a structure in the vision of healthcare policies. You see then, we, I worked not only in the university, and I had opportunity of working with the environment to other regions. And then for example, once in the world. And believe you me, the sorry, in the community are very easy to mobilize, except if we don't mobilize them. And when I work with BPFN, we also use that. Before BPFN will establish an office in Niger State, they will visit that state, they will visit the government and ask for a structure to be used for service provision and family planning. And then they will request for staff. Now we are inviting the buy in of the government. And if those structures or resources are available, then BPFN will establish. That uh, I mean, the, the organization will have itself established in that in that state. But if there is no much buy-in of the government, they don't establish in that state. And I think establishing primary healthcare is not just for the government or an individual, especially those who are into politics. Politics. So you make as it, I will provide hospital for you people and whatever whether there is something to put in the hospital. And these resources cut across both human and material resources, and not just to establish a structure. And government does that mistake as well. If you're a politician, I feel you, if you want to establish any clinic in any community, either your own community or your own season, they call it politically. They should contact you people at the uh, stakeholders first. Now, what extent? Is it just to provide a structure? Is it that you are also going to provide materials requested? There are some states in this country that they will say we employ nurses and pay them for one or two years to be providing services. After that, then government will give the opportunity to the government then to now start preparing on how to buttress what that individual has done by employing staff to fix in those healthcare facilities. And uh, I remember even here in Mina, there is a clinic in Chanchaga to be very specific. I'm just using that as an example. Where we advocated to the, look, to the world leader, then before we established that clinic. First of course, the community accepted and gave us a viewing center, which PPFN demarcated and made it functional as a clinic. The community provided a security match, a security night guard who watch over it. The place was not looking clean. I mean, the environment. They got their youth to weed the environment. We didn't have water supply to that very viewing center. But the community facilitated it by ensuring that they get someone who laid a pipe to provide water in that place. And an individual also provided a generator. How was it wrong? What used to happen is that they are always ready. If you intimate them very well, they are always ready to say 50, 50 Naira a month, 100, 100 Naira a month. And at the end of the month, you'll be able to fund well and But I, uh, what I want to even for how long do we continue to rely on Nigeria Health Watch, rely on other donor agencies to give us healthcare services? Do we used to forget that after two, three, five years, they will back and go? Mm -hmm. Then what happens? The same thing, we need to intimate the community. I'm so happy with what this gentleman said, the WDC secretary. 
he has done quite a lot using the individual or whatever. We are all good advocates. There is no one that cannot advocate to any level, whether your husband, your father, your relations, or not even your relations. We should be free with each other that to an extent. Because if, like now, at the government level, a commissioner or somebody very big will travel outside to have an operation on Hymia or to remove Gweta. If I have ever seen a, a wife of a family secretary who went to insert IUCD outside the country. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> now tell me, and this morning, if we want to use it very well, we are supposed to use it for those who are less privileged, who don't even have money to provide health care services. Instead of a permanent secretary's wife, you go outside the country to the same Thank you very much, Ma. Um, very important, two very important points that you've already set in motion. You've told us the need for buy-in of the community. That is our entry point. And then you've also touched on sustainability. But um, before I move on from you, Ma, I'm very curious to know currently what is in place in the community to account for maternal the place in the community to account for the human death is not in the community. They should be carefully selected. And I think the majority should be females. The majority of the committee should be the females. And there should be good rapport between, the, between them and whomever is in charge of the facility. So that communication between both of them flow. And because they know the importance of this healthcare facility that is available in their community, as intimated by the health workers, they will be willing, they will be willing to contribute whatever is required for them. And then as someone talk, among them, someone mentioned the issue of supervision. They should be equipped to be able to supervise healthcare workers apart from the supervisors that are coming from the health workers because they are the immediate and they are the ones enjoying the service of the healthcare facility. They should be able to sort of maybe the, is it the community leader or the secretary once in a while walk into the building. What is it that they have? What is it that they don't have? How are the staff behaving in patient, patient client relationship? Is the rapport flowing smoothly? Because some of us are health workers and we tell you, how are the ones that we can tell you when we want to do it? And uh, through that, they will be able to know the standard of what is happening in that facility, whether they are creating the cooperation of the nurses or not. And if there are enough skilled individuals who will provide all the range of services that is required in that healthcare facility. And the midwives, midwives can palpate and conduct the meeting. There are other areas in the vision of family in the community. And I think other ones are like, in our own tax, maybe when you use the on the job training or whatever, you can be able to provide advertising or organization or some other things. But there are specific needs. A midwife who is there who will take care of the pregnant woman, and then someone who will provide family planning services. If she has been trained to provide those dual, uh, if the midwife has been trained to provide those dual services, it's still okay. So there must be a very strong link between the community and the healthcare Because during their meetings, they will discuss a range of issues that they have initiated during the month or during the conference. And they will now go back to inform the primary health and development. So I'm sure we're going to hear. Oh, yes, I was just going to say, I'm sure we're going to hear more from Dr. Jinedu and even Dr. Magaji on the guidelines and what it means to actually constitute an MPTSR um, committee. But um, 
let me uh, move on to um, Mr. Matthew beside you there, also from the community perspective. So for someone who has been in this space for a while, thank you very much for um, volunteering and you know, uh, spending time in the community and giving us um, this insight. We are curious to know in your experience, you know, how has it been managing without the structures currently existing in the community? How has accountability for maternal and child death really been, been handled? And thank you. Um, before the exist the current structures that we have, um, one can categorically say that there has been no accountability. Because number one, it is what you know, uh, where to report to and who to report to that you will take actions on. Uh, for for citizens to be aware of uh, what uh, we call the community accountability and the uh, MPD SR, the, it is pertinent that there should be continuous engagement in the community. There should be sensitization. The community should be mobilized to actually know what are the Provide whatever the uh, percentage or either 80% of it happens from the community or 20% from the facilities. There is need for the community members to know why it is like this. How can we prevent it? When it happens, what are we going to do? What are we, who do we report to? Who do we call? But the community doesn't have all this information. When a baby dies before 12, I mean before the age uh, five, just get the baby buried. Nobody, you know, would even understand what what means. When the woman die, um, you know, as a result of the opioids, we just talk about. We don't talk about it. In fact, some families will tell you we don't want people to know, and they don't want uh, shame because they will say, "My wife died after pregnancy or after giving birth. Probably I'm not taking care of my wife or whatever." Or probably there's going to be litigation. However, when we report all these issues, all these cases, it helps us to prevent not only, um, you know, uh, the accountability part of it is for us to be able to prevent. If it happens in a facility like twice, we will be able to know what are the causes of these issues. Is it by uh, Hygiene on the side of the facility management. Is it that the uh, the lazy on the side of the health workers, or is there a um, a recurrent issue in that particular facility? So there was no uh, all these information in place. There was no um, structure. But when uh, we have the MPDRS SR in place, the there are uh, there should be more you know constructive synergy. With the community members. Take, for example, the WDC. Setting up a WDC, well, there are a lot of, uh, there is um, a scope in place to select members into that uh, committee. But unfortunately, we will ne we neglect, uh, if you go to Lagoon local government, we have uh, the Rice Farm Association who are women, they have their association. But if you come to be that local government, the case is different. The association you meet there are the Kuli Kuli, you know, uh, producers and sellers association. Then, if you now call to Mina, you have the majority who are, you know, market women. Now, it is better for us to take into consideration. We already added C and the elderly. Who takes care of the elders? It's the women. Who was the child that died? It is the women. We talk about the uh, the pregnant. We are still talking about women, so we should take cognizance about the women groups that are in our society. They are very pivotal, you know, to ensuring that all the challenges we are talking about, they can best provide possible solutions in order to you know um, address them. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. Um... It's getting and taking shape very well. 
And now we're going to hear from Dr. Ginidu. Um, we understand that um, this year, in June precisely, sir, there was a training in um, of national um, of a national level for instituting and establishing CMB and the PSR committees. And I would like to know, has it been adopted and domesticated in Niger? And um, how is that going to actually address the issue of accountability that we have touched on so far? All right. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a good question. Actually, the document was developed, and I'm happy to see that is one of whom also was a contributor. I'm talking about Dr. Aminu Magaji, I saw his name. He was part of the contributor to that document. Very beautiful document. There's a training manual, and then there's a MPCDR guidelines. And then it was developed in 2022 and it's ready. Now, after that, I think it followed the training of trainers, the national training of trainers, which took place in Akwanga. And fortunately, we also have a state representative. I represented the state there. So thereafter, I think the next level is for us to be able to cascade the training down to state, then down to community. Like the first speaker said, we, a lot of research has been done and we found out that most of, more than 80% of the death, maternal death, uh, are factors within the community that contribute to that. So we found out that Allowing MPC there to exist at the level of Dr. Magaji, where he at the facility is not enough because it's about, you can account for only about 20%. So we think it's very, very pertinent for us to move in as quickly as possible to see that we get down to the community level. So I think the first thing is when you look at the manual, the manual is explicit. It gives the committees at various levels from the national, from the state, from the state, we have the state. We have the state primary care development agency. We have the local government structure. We have the facility structure and then down to community structure. So these are the level that it existed. And when you look at the judgment, like I said, it's explicit. You don't need to reinvent the wheel or do anything. It's a clear reflection of what we have seen. I think the only thing we're not domesticated is the national. That is the national structure. But right from the state down to the community, it's what we require to implement. So. We are adopting the document as it is, nothing to change, nothing to review. All the specification fit our context. At the State Minister of Health, we look at that. At the MPCR committee, they look at that. It meets our specification. It's just for us to get additional manual and then to continue to, to, to put all the machinery in place for the implementation. Now, the first one is national training of trainers, which it's currently ongoing in other states. We are in the second phase. The first phase is built to start today. And then the next phase is going to be the last week of this month. So we're hoping to be part of that. The challenge we had is we should have done it earlier than now, but we're looking at the funding. Initially, the funding of this comes in from the impacts of the state. Unfortunately, our state is not part of the impact state. So what we do quickly is for us as a state to sell the ball ruling to be able to see how we can be part of that impact state. We've written to State Primary Care Development Agency, National. We're waiting for the approval. As soon as we've gotten the approval, we're writing another letter to Federal Ministry of Planning. And then hopefully we're going to be incorporated. Once we send a letter of commitment that we can meet up all the counterpart funding and other things, they will not be included in that. However, we're still discussing with other partners to see what we can get other part support for us to be able to implement that. The moment we now do the state training of trainers. The next thing is we will now move to the community. At the state, we've done the engagement and sensitization of the stakeholders at the state. Everybody is aware. And they will also allow the state MPC that to take this to their community and discuss about that, to tell them that, look, we're coming in to, for them to be on the lookout that we are going to implement this. So any moment from now, we're going to do the state training of trainers. As soon as we finish, Part of the next step is for us to agree on the local government engagement and then the formation of the local government PCR committee. And then it took that. We hope to achieve this in the next quarter. So basically, this is what we're doing. And then we're still discussing with partners for us to get a sufficient funding to do that. Not forgetting that whatever we do at the SPCD will always 
put sustainability in the context. So we're also discussing with other existing programs on how we can sustain this once we began the implementation. So basically, that's all we have at the SBCD level. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, so it has been it has been adopted, domesticated. Yes. Sustainization has happened already. Yes. Um, so as we're discussing, um, Madam Mary and Mr. Matthew have raised some very pertinent um, issues regarding um, women representation that has um, re um, remained in my memory. So I would like to ask, and I would also ask um, Dr. Magaji to respond to this. Is the representation adequate considering what Madam Mary and Mr. Matthew have mentioned? Women representation in the uh, um, MPTSR committees. All right, you know, they've, they've been they're talking from one perspective and the perspective they're looking at is the WDC. The WDC has a manual minimum service package and it clearly spelled out the composition of that WDC, including women representation, including the market women. In fact, it's clearly specified the percentage of women, just like the way it happened in all the documents for them to be, to be represented within that DWHTC. So it exists. However, sometimes, like he was giving an example, the adoption varies from one place to another. There are places you find out that women are less represented, are less, are, are, are less in terms of representation, others more. It's, it's context specific. It's, yes, it varies from one community, but we try as much as possible to see that they are represented in that. That is on that angle. Now on the MPC there, the MPC there at the community level lies at the heart of the WDC and the other community structure. And one of the things that was agreed at the nation within the manual is that the, the chief's agent should be the main informant within the community. So all the MPC there structure start from the uh, chief's agent. Why? Because of their importance in terms of moving prevention. They are the ones that know the pregnant woman. They are the ones that know all about it. So they are the, they, they, they are the, 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 the community MPC that starts and rests in that table. So they are very, very instrumental in doing that. And most of them in our community, I think even in the guideline, clearly stipulate a woman is our chief's agent. So even at that, they are well represented. And even at the facility, we ensure that it is the women that are in the maternal and childhood that are involved in that. So they are well represented once we move in. So for now, is the WDC they are currently there. Once we now set the ball rolling for the MPC that are at the community level, undoubtedly we have more women participate and their voice will be heard. Um, Dr. Mogaji, um, I while also you know, adding your voice to that um, train of conversation, I'd like to ask specifically if this has ever posed a challenge, so to say, at um, the state level or where you have been so far managing the um, MPDSR um, committee. Has the constitution of uh, women or, or that kind of representation, has it ever constituted a challenge, sir? Oh, I, I think that um, the lawyers will say, if, it, if you are making law about us, it must be for us. You can't decide for women without women being there. Okay, and more so, it pertains to their life. Okay, so at, he has explained very beautifully, thank God, uh, uh, I've had the opportunity at national level, I think with her first in Abuja where the guidelines were developed. And then another opportunity in 2022 general internal where um, modification and ratification of those guidelines and uh, uh, whatever, and an introduction of the uh, legal part to community medicine was introduced. So women are represented very well, and especially the community of BDSI. And then at the facility MPDSR, you know, um, we don't have a head of nursing services who is not a, most of them are women. Okay, so, and they are 
the uh, heart of the constitution of MPJSR at that level, at the facility level. The in charge of the labor world is also part, supposedly, of that committee. Men are not in charge of the labor world. So um, you also have, you know, uh, um, a honorable said we're supposed to have a representative from Minister of Women Affairs. And I think that is by proxy because we have the social unit, social department, or what do you call them now, the social welfare units in the hospital. Those are essentially staff that come from Women Affairs who has um, <clears throat> women's are at heart. They know uh, they are vulnerable group. They know what's, uh, they are coming there on behalf of women. And so they are also part of LPDS at, at um, facility uh, level. Okay, so women are very well uh, represented at that uh, uh, level, but more importantly, or more strongly at the community LPDS level. Okay, he has spoken of uh, uh, the two chip being part of. Chip and then CD, uh, the new DC, DC beam, the structure at community level for MPDS. And we know how those uh, two they are constituted. Okay, they have women at the center of it. You know, to say that we cannot discuss what women face with their life without them getting involved. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm grateful. Um, I know that we must first learn to walk before we can run, and um, but we have touched on sustainability, and it's a very good way to go. So even before we are able to do um, the community level and PDSR get it going, we've already indicated some very key positions, and uh, that need to be in place. But um, I'd like to before we go. Um, from my panelists, I'll start with uh, Mr. Matthew, just as something that can guide and, you know, ensure that, you know, when we take off, everything is in place. What are those little nuances that we need to be mindful of when the community MPDSR is set? Yes. Um... When we are talking about uh, the community uh, MPD, CMPDSR, um, we can't take away the place of, I will continue to say, we can't take the place of women. And we should look for them where they are more, you know, where they will be more eager to listen to us. That is the first point of call, when they will be more eager to listen to us. If you want to talk to, uh, a women group who are who trades in Kuli Kuli in Bida. You, you don't choose a day for yourself. Look for them when they are having meetings. Five minutes is enough to educate them. That's very important. And when we want to talk to the elites, we we ran a program in NEPST uh, recently. We actually picked a couple of these, but unfortunately, it was turned down several times. And I told the program and I said, let us meet them on the day they are having their own meeting. Don't choose a date for them. At that point, we had, when, when, we had, when we had about 200 people in attendance, in the other meeting, we had about 600. So this will give you more output. Fine, the, at the service delivery point, if we have women there, but when we are now talking to the larger society of women, where do we meet them? So these are very, very important. Then to the elites, we, we should use, um, look at, do they have WhatsApp channel where they talk together and all that? We should look for, you know, jingles or com some communications, strategic communications, you know, um, items to, you know, share with them so that they can continue to engage. So let them realize that this is their own thing. They should, uh, they, they need to own it. So it's not our program. So why, I'm sorry to say, why the, um, why the, the community, the, um, the World Development Committee Secretary was saying that they like NGO. When we go to the community, we don't go as if it's our program. We give it to them. We let them own it. 
tell us when we want to come. Where do you want us to meet? You understand? Okay, we want to provide refreshment for what did you want us to provide? So they will like you more. They will have more trust in you. But when you think it's your program, it's your program. It's never your program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. Madam Mary, how do we ensure sustainability of CMPDSR? To ensure sustainability, we still have to go back to the community. The plan has to start with the community and then the government. We know government has a lot of uh, a lot of issues that can to take care of financially. And when we go to them as a uh, baby stakeholders to intimate to tell them that look, we are going to do everything, we'll provide this, provide that, provide that. Yes, you will provide. But let them have input. When they have serious input, they look at it as their own. And believe you me, I have seen a community around the Manufashi area some years back, I don't know whether it is still feasible, where the whole clinic was run by them. What they simply did was to mobilize themselves. All that was required was for them to have a list from the, from the government side. And they went ahead, the government put up the building quite all right for them, but they went ahead, provide all that is required. Then government now sent um, staff to them. Let me give you an example with uh, Mina here, Barkin Sally. When we had to establish a clinic in Barkin the world had provided the land and they actually started building. Who is a bricklayer? Who can provide one bag of cement? Who can, not that, at times you do that not because you feel the government doesn't have, but you want them to feel the pain. Eh? Tinibu said he's feeling the pain that we are feeling. So they should also feel the pain that government is feeling. Because at times when we say government will do everything, everything, when there are issues, when there are fail, when there is failure from the government part, what happens? They keep on, Either then we say, maybe Dr. Magaji, they gave him the money, Magaji, he has eaten the money. But let them also be part and parcel. And let that emphasis be drawn into their case, that they are part, and after all, they are taking care of their own health. Dr. Magaji is not going there to provide the public services. And then the issue of uh, training, identifying qualified students or individuals from their community to be trained so that when they go back after the training, they will be within that community and they will be the one to provide services to their own people. That is also very, very important. And, um, and, and again, uh, then we used to also mobilize communities to do something for the health workers and they were doing it. They were doing it without minding that Government is the one that is on top of the affairs when it comes to provision of services. We will tell them that, look, this uh, in charge or these people working in this clinic, you know, they are far away from the town and uh, it is not easy for them to stay within this local community. Maybe there's no light, no good schools for their children and whatever. What they do is that for gratification, during harvest, each household will provide even if it is one one module of rice, some two bars of yam, take everything to the clinic some years back or not now. And I think if we bring this back again, we encourage the farmers because most of them are farmers in the rural areas. Even if it is one two bars of yam, that they will just bring them together and the clinic will share. And some of them, they can have a piece of land to farm something for them if they have extra land, either beside the clinic or whatever. So I think uh, that will also assist us to sustain and to retain the staff yes. that are working there. And then when it comes to promotion, we don't want to see healthcare providers running up and down headquarters in Genchik. I want to go and fill my upper form. I want to go and follow up my promotion. Are you supposed to be following up your promotion? No. Once you are qualified, once you are qualified, at times there are you promotion. They've done the promotion, but, but no salary implementation. 
they are not supposed to follow up. At least if government can try to give that to them as an incentive, it will go a long way to retain the staff who are working in the rural area. And then if they have something, is it bush allowance or whatever thing you have, if you have more of it. Uh -huh. If that is also available, as soon as that person is posted there, it should be implemented immediately. Not that they will be coming to the headquarters, I'm following it up, I'm following it up, please. I think that will also help us to sustain and to also retain staff that are posted to the rural areas. Yes, we've heard reward, we've heard ownership, we've heard um, very clear definition of roles, what the community can do to actually ensure that this works because at the end of the day, it is for them. And uh, it's been clearly said by Madam Mary and uh, Mr. Matthew. Um, we're going to hear from the government side. Um, policies, guidelines go a long way. We know the place of laws uh, and regulations. So we want to hear how is this going to be sustained? Not start and stop. Once it starts, it continues. Dr. Ginedu, let me start from you. All right, for people that know agency very well, I think sustainability is at the heart of our project implementation, cut across all our project interventions. So there are a lot of things that are in place where we want to ensure. First and foremost, we want to leverage on the WDC, World Health Development Committee. They are very, very key, they are instrumental in terms of ensuring community accountability for their facilities and all other common facilities that is within their community, including the community epicenter, because the chief agent we're having there work closely with the WDC. And if there's any other issue, they are the point of, so they help us to sustain the activity of the chief's agent. Then the second one, again, I think what it really to us, it's a very, is the, is, the, is the newest catch in the state now, is the, is the split of Ministry of Health into two. Now we have two Ministry of Health. We have Ministry of Health and hospital services, and then we have Ministry of Primary Healthcare. Now the governor was asked, why is he creating primary healthcare? And he said, the primary healthcare has over the years been underfunded because of a lot of bureaucracy in trying to access funding. Now, primary healthcare are created and you have equal power like any other ministry. You have a, a commissioner that will be sitting at the executive council to present your memo. So this is one of the things that happened. As a ministry now, they are able to help create a budget line and they'll be able to get funding so that will sustain not only the community MPC but across all our primary healthcare intervention. Then another one again is the basic healthcare provision fund. Remember, the basic healthcare provision fund, the state government has the responsibility of paying a counterpart funding of 25% onto what the federal government are giving. And then every quarter, 300,750 is being sent directly to all the 274 facilities. Now, one of the things we've tried to do, or we're thinking we're going to do, is that part of the funding, there is a budget line for community outreach activity. We're trying to see, can we allocate, no matter how little the funding is within that community outreach, so that it will be able to cater for this community intervention that we're going to do. And we started discussing that with the director of PNC. Let's get out of that info community a little, no matter how little, so that by the time we have it cumulatively, the ministry can decide to just give a push and they will begin to fund our community MPC there. Then the NICARE too, usually there's something the NICARE call capitation process. I'm sure she's aware of what we said. What is capitation process? Every time NICARE send a capitation, the facilities are meant to settle all the bills of the people that access service for that month. What remains as a positive they call it the capitation process. Now, this capitation process, the NICA gave a sharing formula for this. So, so, so amount for community outreach. So, so amount for support supervision. So, so amount for infrastructure and maintenance. What we tried to do, we said, look, out of that percentage, we started engaging them. Is there any way part of that? Can they create another percentage so that it will be a mark? 
for our community MPC there. That is another thing we're doing. And then so this little funding from the basic on the SPC way, and the small one from the NHS gateway, we allow you to you know, cumulatively over some time, so we get some substantive funding for you to do that. So we want to start as soon as possible, even before Magaji and his team finish the training of health care so that we have something to start up. No matter how, let it support this small, small meeting that we have at the community level. This is key. And then the other thing, again, is the, she discussed about, the, it, there are a lot of things, again, while we look at it from the community, we also look at the facility. How do we make the facility? I had a lot of people complaining facilities are not running cheap. I'm sure the NLC chairperson here knows about it. I'm sure all the doctors are the notes about that. People have been working at the health facility for a very long time without shifting allowance. This is a statutory allowance that needs to be given to them. But over the years, it has not been paid. And so it's very difficult for now the government to now force them to be running that shift. It was, one of the things the government are doing now is the introduction of this shifting allowance. I'm not sure the NLT and the Mogadi were part of this. There's a community that was developed share with the government. I would say, look, one of the things is most people are having the commerce is not commiserate with other people elsewhere. One. And then secondly, our healthcare workers at the facility don't enjoy shifting allowance. Yet we want them to do that. So because they don't have shifting allowance, and that was why sometimes you can't you can save less or nothing about them not really shifting. They open in the morning like a shop owner and they close in the evening. But we're trying to sustain that. We've already begun to tell them that they have to do that. But we're trying to see how we can bring that. So the governor said he wants to know the wage bill. It should be made available to him. If that will be the case, then he's going to address that. And then with the coming of the ministry, I think they'll be able to pursue this vigorously on their own as a standalone ministry. So these are some of the things we put in place to ensure that we sustain the community MPC that, and even all other community intervention. Another one, again, which I forgot to mention, is the BMGL. We signed a, an MOU with BMGL for four years. And one of the things they are doing principally is on supporting the rollout of chips. So out of that, we've already agreed on the new cost extension for the next four years. So one of the things we've been working with the ED and then other stakeholders is to see if we can, part of that, we can create some budget line because we've looked at the concept not we want to create additional budget line for this community. So when you look at all this small, small, we're trying to take advantage of all the funding that are coming for all communities so that we take advantage of small, small funding so that we pull it to support the community MPC. So this is where the thinking is. I'll continue to work towards this direction. Thank you, Dr. Junior. I think when we talk about sustainability from government, it always boils down to budgets, allocations, and releases. So if we're hearing from you now that this is, you know, this has, there's a plan for how this is going to be ensured, uh, I think it gives us hope. And, and, and don't forget, I try to, I try to be very careful not to bring the project line. It's an additional one. What I'm telling you is when you're looking about sustainability, you look at the funding that is readily available. I think for now, basic healthcare provision will continue to come in until there's a change of policy. There's an act. That funding is bought by an act. 1% of CRF is a mark for that one. That's what we're leveraging. I didn't even talk about the budget line for that. So we'll be very careful to see that those funding that exist will leverage on them while we look for other opportunities for the funding that come from the government. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Dr. Mugaji. Yes, sir. Um, while you're giving us your, your um, rounding up statement, I'd like you to really clarify a little bit more on no blame, no name, because at the end of the day, that is what accountability in MPDSR is all about. So while you're giving us your rounding up statement, please just drive home that point in a way that even a five-year-old child will understand when she hears or he hears. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, in a way of, in a way of rounding off this discussion on my part, uh, I think it's very important to look at those challenges we have had implementing MPDSR, like one of the questioners said, so that we can leverage on that to avoid those pitfalls when we eventually start committing MPDSR. And um, 
like I've said earlier, uh, there are a lot of challenges, not only uh, no blame, no shame. There are other uh, challenges, but no blame, no, sh no, no name means that you are looking at what led to somebody dying, that woman dying. Yes, we know she came with something. She came bleeding. She came convulsing. Those are the natural things that have a direct process of death if nothing was done. What prevented us from doing something so that this woman lives? Those are the things we call contributing factors. And in contributing factors, we looked at, okay, the context the woman came, the clinical context. You are in the hospital and then the woman came convulsing because of BP. Because of BP, there was no control. It wasn't controlled because she didn't even go to antenatal care. It didn't go to antenatal care because the husband said he has no money. Or the husband said, I don't want you to go and uh, a man looking at you. Or the man says, I don't have money. There's no need for you to go antenatal care because even me, my mother born me without going for antenatal care. All of those things, you, you trust them, they go back to the community, the person, the family, the husband, and you know, even the other stakeholders in the community. So by the time uh, uh, somebody comes to the clinic, convulsing or the first facility, convulsing, bleeding, and so on, the pressure now is on the staff. Mm -hmm. We brought this woman and then uh, one stupid, um, I'll use an example of what happened in my facility, where the, 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 the patient relation even pictured the snaps uh, Dr. Juliana who was on board, and then send it on WhatsApp. See the stupid girl who, 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 who is calling herself a doctor that didn't come to attend until the woman dies and so on. And it was everywhere, hey, this new woman dies because Dr. Juliana didn't come to appoint her. Julius, Dr. Juliana was the only person who was on call who came from doing five cesarean section at a stretch. So she has spent eight hours in the theater only for her to come and receive a slap from patient relation who thought they were waiting for this patient to. So, I, 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 not only Dr. Juliana, Dr. Well, uh, uh, what do they call it? Dr. Sharon and his wife, the wife received a slap because the same thing happened saying they were waiting and they didn't come. And then this picture was aging well. And before you know it, they felt that the whole hospital, the whole Niger state were against them. They had left. They are, they, are, they are in UK now. So that is, and why the woman died, why this woman died, nobody is talking about them. What is being talked is somebody who make a mistake, intentional or intentional, who they think in their perception led to the death of the woman. Every other thing, those contributing factors have been buried. And then the person carries the blame. And has he solved any problem? No, it wasn't the situation. They left and we are left by four doctors because they were depressed. They were in decision media, they couldn't sleep. And second, have we identified why this woman died? Have we put in place how to respond, an actionable response, so that somebody else does not die, no. So, like I mentioned, it is historical that because of confidential inquiry into maternal death, not naming anybody, not blaming anybody, was the result. The Europe achieved almost zero maternal mortality. We can't be different. And we are seeing it. So it is, hey, somebody will just come and um, and I'm going to uh, prestige. I brought my wife, and then before you know it, the, the doctors did it, or he did the wrong. You know, all sort of things coming up. Nobody listens. Things are easily swept under the carpet if we blame somebody. So that is the one that we want to tackle. There cannot be blame or naming somebody. After all, mistakes in healthcare system. Mistakes is usually not committed by one, by one person. The mistake is usually poor communication between you people, or the guy, he likes the skill, 
you know, to, to do what he was supposed to do. Or the mistake was even unintentional because of there was no teamwork. But nobody looks at those things. And those things pass it. You only catch somebody and, oh, hey, this is a butcher. Somebody wouldn't have gone to medical school, gone to postgraduate school and then come to keep people in the hospital. So that blame, no blame, no shame must be taken out because that is actually what killed, not even uh, the, the part of what killed the emperor is will kill the MPDS. It is what will lead to people leaving uh, the society. Please permit me to just run through those things that gave us challenges while we are implementing MPDS so that we ensure they don't occur as we are starting the community practice. I've talked about actions. Communication down. Okay, we have communications down. The commissioner, Pam Sex, Minister of Health, the, the media says we are losing 400 women that comes to deliver in JBA, for example, every year. And, and then the Pam Sex sends to Dr. C. You don't know what's happening. You people, you know that kind of a thing. Communication, they just stay there and then send directives, instructions, and so on. Nobody listening from down. Oh, we have done MPDS and said, sir, this woman died because the, uh, uh, the, the, the wife had a transverse line with a previous cesarean section. And he came to our facility and said that he doesn't have money. We said, let's admit your wife. Go and look for money. We will section her when we need to arrive. How can you deliver a baby that is like this through the vagina? And then he said, oh, he will take his wife home. He took his wife home. Please promise us you are coming on Saturday. He didn't come on Saturday until one day in the morning. When the baby started coming, opened the baby. And by the time the woman was in her facility, she was gasping. And then she died. And then everybody blames the hospital for this particular thing. Even the commissioner asked to come and say, okay, this is an embarrassment to the government. And there is no any, oh, let's go and hear up and see what happens so that, you know, we will know what to do. If um, uh, um, we sit down and do MPDS now and bring out what kills or contributed to killing this woman and sent it, this will be the recommendation. We expect that up there, Actions will be taken. If action is taken, it gives the MPDS confidence. Oh, what we recommended and action has been performed on it. So we we'll have the energy to continue to do the MPDS. When you send recommendations, nothing happens. So you send what, what? What? Yeah. Yes. I want you to go to the next one apart the from the one. actions because I really want us to hear this challenge. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Then it's the the. The uh, uh, supportive supervision, you know, we find out uh, uh, um, people, people, if, if I'm not there, let me see, I'm the MD, they say I'm trained. If I'm not there, and those who we have trained, you know, most of them, like I said, have left my facility. Green ones are the ones that are there as in doc doctors and nurses who have not had training on that particular. It will happen at the community level, where those who had had training are no longer there. Or they are there, but they are beginning to forget the guidelines and instructions. So you need somebody to be supervising. If you send somebody to come and see the work you are doing, supervision is not the traditional way. In MPDS, where you, you, you somebody suggested, you just pop in so that you find people napping. That is not it anymore. That was the traditional way of doing things. You go there because you want to help the problem they are facing. You want to go and say, too, see, we are here. If you are overwhelmed, we are here. If there are new trends or new challenges you are facing, we are here. You go frequently. If somebody knows that they, you, you have their back, they will put in their best. It's not the traditional way of value that is looking for somebody to blame. The third one Ma, is that we actually need a very serious advocacy period. This man is my enemy. I don't know why. 
I'm still harassing you. I, I, I was thinking that you would feel these things are very important by now. Okay. Yes, sir. Just um, so we have to have rules at advocacy visit because we have to talk to our leaders, we have to talk to our community where these things are going to reside. That about that, no blame, no shame. Because politicians will just come and uh, uh, they are being embarrassed. Somebody died, bro. A friend of theirs, a relative of theirs, a big person, wife died, and then they come and decapitate you. It's not that is not correct. The the other things that has actually has had only caused the challenge was his incentive. Incentive, even the actions that okay, this is the problem we had, and then somebody acted on it and solved the problem. It's an incentive. You feel motivated to do more. They have mentioned the issue of allowances. As we speak now, there is no shitty allowance in primary care facilities. How do you expect somebody to run shift without a shitty allowance? Okay, and then there is no any incentive to give somebody who is going to do extra work. I'm going to do verbal and uh, social autopsy to come and see that analyze the problem to say these are the problem so that if we do these actions, this will reduce. There's no such incentive. Probably, if you if uh, health was decided to say, look, I recognize Dr. Modern for contributing to reducing what I will mention this as citation everywhere. So do that. Those are part of incentive, not really. Uh, just money alone. Those who are doing this in a community level find a way of giving them an award, a letter, they, you know, a certificate. Me, I carry my mom, my own, together with my CBA, say thank you, Dr. Magani, thank you for reducing your efforts in reducing maternal mortality. Chiefs, chiefs who are doing, even CD and chairman or whoever, recognize someone, give him that paper. He will be proud to present it. It's part of it's something. So you must have that as an uh, incentive. Maybe lastly, because uh, my enemy said. <laughs> lastly, Dr. Bogashi. <laughs> yes. My, my enemy said, I should stop. We, we really have to look at uh, the community has to know that those who will serve them are those who are from them. You cannot, you, we can't, you don't accept somebody coming from Paikoro to Munya. It's not possible that that person will stay in your community. So you people find a way of finding your own, okay, to provide the, 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 the staffing you need in your facility. So it's very, very important. The community through the CD, uh, the C, the C, WDC should take up that, that the only person who can serve you, who can stay, who you can see 247, is only those who are within you. So give them education, uh, support them, Always say that they see that these are the people that will want them to be employed or to be carried along. Lastly, again, <laughs> Niger State is very blessed already. We are like already positioned for this community in PBSR. We have a very vibrant world development committee. We have a very vibrant chips uh, program. And recently, I went on training where they are going to bring CRISP again, a community based research and services initiative where we will have resident doctors, maybe better medical center, coming to community to teach them what is okay at teaching hospital level, okay, to mentor them, to stay there as part of their work stay, so that they stay in the village and provide the service, they get back for that. So this thing combined is actually going to strengthen Community accountability for maternal health. Thank, Thank you, very you much. Doc. Thank you, Doc. I wish we had more time because it is um, very educating, it is very insightful. And I'm sorry that we've um, rushed you, but I believe that we are better um, equipped, so to say, to actually get this um, going. We've heard um, from experiences, what we need to watch out for when the community MPDSR starts running. We've heard what we need to sustain it. We've heard commitment. We've heard the issue of ownership, engagement, buy-in. These are terms that we are familiar with in this space. So it needs us to actually follow it through with um, actions. 
Um, most importantly, I'd like to say that just as um, Dr. Magaji has explained what no blame, no name is, I want to say that for us, Nigeria Health Watch, the issue of accountability for maternal and child death is not um, to draw out um, names or to witch hunt or to, you know, punish. No, it's just like he has explained, to actually trace what those causes are so that they can be nipped in the bud. And just like um, all of us are here because we care to actually find lasting solutions. So if this um, MPDS are, are in place, and if we're able to start from the community level to take ownership and to address it, I believe that we're going to see a drastic change in these numbers that are coming in. And it starts with us. Let me not sound like a Barack Obama and say change starts with you, but really it does start with um, you and I. Um, I don't know if we still have questions for the, the panelists. Yes. Um, I'll take we have but one. Yes. Please, one. Um, good. Uh, we are in afternoon already. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Abdurrahman Awal, the Executive Director of Quality Life for Persons with Special Needs Foundation. I beg to sit on the existing protocols, please. My only, the only thing I want to chip in here, I've been seated here since uh, is the program is supposed to start by 10. And I have not prepared any plan or where the, this thing is in the policy of primary health care. How do you plan to attend to women with disabilities, most especially people with hearing disability? Since you, they can't talk to you and you can as well not be able to talk to them without any training. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. That was all we can take for now. I'm so sorry. Um, Engaging people with disabilities. Anyway, I am just speaking on my experience as a social gynecologist that is attending to women at the clinic, at the level one, in fact, in theater. Those women, like he mentioned, they, they are my friends. They come, so, so I have three or four of them. One was pregnant, very disabled. Maybe uh, 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 physical disability, even mental disability that woman had. Then you have those who are just hearing problem and talking problem. So how did we communicate? How do we see that communicate with this, this, uh, this, this uh, my clients or my patients? It's usually writing, through writing. You know, we, we exchange, you, you write, I write, you write, I write. That's one. Number two, we have a very, let me, uh, 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 a cleaner who is very fluent in communicating sign languages. So I also use her, and then she, in fact, sometimes I take her to follow us to theater so that uh, she help express to us what uh, she's feeling and we had to have to express to her what she should expect in this theater and, and, and all that. Thirdly, we normally say they normally come in company with relatives. And so the relatives helps communications between us and uh, and and them. I would have liked to be trained in how to communicate with these people, but I have too much book to read on so other subjects. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. For, for community MPDS and this involvement of involvement in the committee MPDS, I think that is a sphere we really have to look at the representation from that side. And I think that it will be a bit easier at primary school level. You know why? Because it looks like uh, uh, people with disability and some form of there's some some form of social work at local government level. And the Chancel representative, I think, from that committee. Thank you, sir, for reminding us that we have missed you out. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, our Abu panelists, my friend Dr. Magaji and others. So I'm going to call Dr. Kaylee for a photo, please.
to a group photograph of Tankini. Thank you, everyone. Um, please, I uh, wouldn't want to be making much noise because of the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, before, so we have just two items on the agenda now, a draft communique. Um, I will have my colleague, um, Oloma Omeje. Oloma, kindly get ready. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the very insightful panels, panel sessions, especially for the um, audience that were very engaged for every one of the sessions. We had multiple people that didn't even get to talk because, and that's just an indication of um, engagement and um, interest in the subject matter. So I'm just going to go over some of the commitments that um, we have made of recommendations that we have made for this um, from this um, panel sessions. For the first one, we had um, we had um, something keep on ringing: the need to work in synergy with the facilities and the communities because that is it is always good to communicate upwards, communicate downwards. That is what is going to ensure accountability and sustainability. We also had, um, we also had um, the need, we had um, the WDC emphasize on the need for improved feedback between the agency and the WDC. And of course, um, all the other things around better engagement at the community level. We also had the need, the the chips deficiency, especially fund defi deficiency, right, be to be addressed by the agency. I think um, Dr. Junedu <laughs> has already um, committed to that. So we are, and he made mention of in the next quarter. So we would um, use that as our timeline for majority of this. Um, for uh, we also had the need for retention of healthcare workers to ensure that these people are actually in their places of um, service delivery. And then for MPF, MPDSR, this is where we had majority of all the other um, commitments. And um, again, we are tracking with the next quarter as a timeline. So um, based on all the things that Dr. Junedo had mentioned, um, with all the advocacy going on at the national level and at the state level to ensure um, to obtain funding, sustainable funding. Um, and this should be done uh, for community MPCDSR, and this should be done by the next quarter. We also have um, prioritizing um, the place of women in these committees because we cannot overemphasize discussing the, the subject of that concerns women, with women having a very good representation. And then we have, um, we had many other um, funding mechanisms um, that was mentioned here. I'll just um, breeze over them, community outreach, Nike hair, the facilities um, running uh, with um, shift allowances to make sure that they are actually able to, you know, function. And again, supervision. And um, again, the last thing actually, um, making sure that these recommendations from these um, committees at the, the MPCDSR committees are not just recommendations, but something is done about it. So it's not just about having this committee and meeting, it's what are we doing with the recommendations that come up? And this is where the community comes in. Um, I think um, that is all with all the um, commitments from this meeting. Thank you very much. 
uh, once again for all the engagement. Thank you, Oloma. Closing remark. Uh, permit me to please call on Dr. Chinedu. He would want to use just two minutes to respond to some comments. All right. Sorry, I just want to take a little of your time just to make some comments. First, I think this is the essence, the policy dialogue, and I hope we've really dialogued very well. But then there are certain things that we need to make it clear as going forward so that we're able to help us in their services. I always look at it that everybody, when based on all the submission that was given, you found out that everybody has a role to play. And I think generally, all of us need to improve our service. And I want to take those into few. You see, the reporting, I know the other person was discussing a lot of things about reporting. Over the years, we allow it to the people like the citizen. One time, the what you want to allow is train some people and they went into the community. They called their community citizen and they were doing and they were doing a lot of work. Now, one of the things we found is exactly what you said. We found out that because there was no control that we give them an open side, some things happen that almost cut our neck. And the also is that. That's why he was telling you about balancing the story. Somebody went in, went to Bangkoji, get the facility, and they sent to the national, to FESA, National Public Care Development Agency, that they have been receiving funding for one year. This facility has not been renovated. Did you get it? It was bad as that. Now, FESA wrote later direct to the ED, and then he wrote to the governor. And then the next thing you see it in the net. You can see how terrible that can be. I was mad. Very, very much in the sense that we know we've given them funding. The next thing is either you're not giving them funding. We now decided to take it all. Unfortunately, this facility has a plan. The, oh, that was what I said, try to get the story. And that was how initially we said, okay, anything we deal with coalition, pass through them, and then they know what we are doing. The next thing, when we went to engage the community, they said, no. The facility sat down with the WTC to develop a plan. The plan, part of it is to do renovation. And then they told him, no, don't do renovation. What we need is drug and then night watchmen to watch over. Because of that time, a lot of these bandits were really encroaching into the facility. And usually when they come to facility, when they break into but they don't do anything. They just take drips and other things and move. So they say, okay, let's get a security before our services and then people that can run shit. Then the renovation, leave it for us. We will do it. That's what the community said. Now, this person didn't get this story. And then the next thing, the health facility are eating the money. And so the next thing, that was why we put a control. And that's why he told it is true. Whatever you do, pass through them. They know how to do it. Balance your story. Discuss with the facility. Ask people that matter. When they helped watch, Nigeria told they were coming. They asked me. They asked ED. They asked her. They asked community before they now develop a story that will do that. So it's very, very important. That's why we have issues with the community citizen at that time. The next thing is FESA on his table for the, for the facility that they have information they provided. And one has say people cannot do this, but they say it's there because they didn't ask. So please, let's be guided and let's be very careful. That's why we introduce a channel of how you can get that. Lastly, if somebody was discussing about unscheduled, these things are technical. People need to know some of the technical tools so that they don't think it's wrong. Now, what they said is that in globally, best practices, under integrated supporting supervision, don't ever visit a facility without giving the information. So this is what I'm coming. So that's why we try to avoid the own schedule. So it's no longer the no. That is the traditional supervision. Whatever they do, people say, okay, but when you inform them, they say, okay, if we inform them, they will do that. Human consciousness, if they do it today, they'll do it tomorrow, it, it becomes internalized. And that's what they said, you must inform them. So please, when you see our officer not in, informing them and go, not that they don't want to catch them, but we are in line with the international best practices. And then the last one, again, is the number of functionality. What I say is that there are about 1,548 facilities across the state. I cannot guarantee all of them are functional. Put me anywhere. Put me anywhere. I can't guarantee all of them are functional. However, the 274 are functional across the world. Please, let's get that one right. And then the last but not the least, the community structure, they are very instrumental and we like engaging them. But sometimes, again, you give them an inch and they take a mile. We'll be very careful. Let me give you a scenario that happened, very important. We said 
the WDC failed, the, sorry, also of our facility failed because the community structure are not involved. We now brought in the community structure. And I said, look, henceforth, the agency will not only be communicating with the health facility, will also communicate with the WDC. When we, write, when we send money to them, we write letter to their chairman because their chairman said they are not engaging them. This is sheer information. We write to the chairman, we write to the director, we write to the officer in charge, and then we write to the WDC chairman. Everybody will have a letter once we send a funding. Unfortunately, in the same issue we're talking about, fight erupted. One of the men, because he was from the king, he said our facility cannot take that money, that they are doing thing with the money he doesn't know. And anybody that do that is going to see the next thing, she wrote a petition. The next thing is goes to the governor. And then the governor called. What happened? And then we intervened. And then we found out that simply because he was not taking a law, or he thinks they are getting something he didn't get. And so he had to hold them to ransom. So then again, we now watch our step in the way we engage the community. And we said, no, no, let's go back. Whatever we do, we instruct the facility and local government to engage them. And that's why we're not engaging with them again more often. So whatever you see we are doing at this 10 level SVC day, sometimes we try and we fail, and then we redress back and change our steps. So basically that's how So when you see things are happening, there is a reason why they are doing. Please help us, ask us. If we don't know, then you can take it to the media. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Janetik. Um, so um, last but not least, of course, is a closing remark from our permanent secretary, Ajay, you're welcome. Yes. Uh, if you don't mind. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, and a special greetings to my mentor, Abdurrahman Awa. Uh, a lot have been said, Dr. Magaizu, maybe this um, program should run for three days and we'll give you two days. Uh, you see, I always wonder why we have Parent Teachers Association and we don't have similar thing in the health sector. If the PTS are doing well, then I think the health sector should look at something similar. All this power tozzle about eating money and then me and one not getting his share will not even come up. Instead, they will be providing their own quota and helping the community. So this is a challenge to the health sector, especially the basic and primary healthcare. Now for this um, accountability, we have said it all. Everybody has a responsibility. Whether you are in the health sector, you are in the agri sector, anywhere you have a responsibility to report and to say. And that is why we all agreed here from his explanation not to name or to shame or to blame. Because we all know in the medical balance what they say the three delays. So by the time, even in ordinary illness, it's not just in pregnancy or maternal issues. These are part of the things that lead to death. By the time people arrive at health facilities, the situation is usually not uh, remediable more than 90% of the time. So please, this is a call on us and the help, uh, health watch and um, the non-medicals here, the community leaders. Health is not a competition. There is no competition in health. It's not in agri where we have the best pharma. It is not. Let us all know that whatever we are doing to provide the right information to the public is for the benefit of all. There is no hero in the health sector. Everybody is a hero. If somebody fails, if somebody fails, one person fails, every other person does. So please, the community, uh, World Health uh, Committee, uh, W, World, World Health Develop um, Development Committee, you have a lot to do. You have a lot to do in working with all the health facilities to ensure that services 
are rendered and information are passed out correctly. The information map, thank you for Dr. Jeanette's uh, last comment. You have, to, um, you have to work with the other media is to, so that there will be a balanced reporting. Uh, then involving women, well, I don't know. I think most of the time, the men are the problems of the women. Yes, they think their job is just to pregnant the women and go. So I think involving them in, in the community, in the committee is not a bad idea, whether the women are there or not. They are the problems. They are the ones that will not be there to take the wives to the hospital. They are the ones that will tell her, okay, why take Kisha Mot? Kisha Shiri? You understand we have had so many, we deal with so many. So please, what committee? Educate the men, sensitize them. The women are not supposed to die giving life. The number of children they want to work on their farm, the mothers have to be healthy. Uh, on a final note, I want to say that communication and uh, enlightenment, public sensitization is the key. And we are the Ministry of Women, uh, Women Affairs. In fact, I don't know why that name is still there. Maybe very soon it will be a woman of uh, Ministry of Gender Affairs because we deal with all gender. We would we'll like to partner with you. We're already partnering with you so that information and the women uh, development officers at the local government should also be involved so that information will be passed as at when to at the right time with the right language, using the right people. You can't go to a community dressed like a king and you call people around, they will feel inferior to you and they will not respond to you. So all these are being addressed. Uh, on the final note, I want to say thank you all. We're supposed to close at two. We didn't start at 10. Please let there be a change. Time for time, the GMT for GMT, Nigerian time, 10 o'clock for 10 o'clock. No more African time. We keep to time. Thank you very much. Thank you for so much, uh, Muhajia Hadiza Shuru. Uh, thank you so much, uh, our permanent secretary. So um, before I uh, draw the curtain, um, one of the things we're doing with respect to the Community Health Watch reporting is uh, creating a platform like this where we can continue to move this conversation forward. Uh, we want to have community members, we want to have all stakeholders from the uh, primary, uh, state primary healthcare development agency, the CBOs, the OICs, the practitioners who are working with these community members together, such that when we produce this kind of stories that we're producing, um, we can have this engagement uh, continue within ourselves and not just the conversation, but to see how we can solve the problems. So um, one of the things we're doing now is uh, we're creating a platform like um, a WhatsApp group. Um, we have a registration from there, which we have collected your information. Uh, we will be reaching to you individually um, to seek for your consent to be part of that um, WhatsApp group, where we will be sharing our reportings and you also will be helping us you know, to move it forward in your, you know, you know, your network and even you know, give your own insight and so on and so forth. So please, um, please, uh, we'll be reaching out to you individually for your consent uh, so that you'll be added into uh, that group. Uh, with that said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming today, uh, for being part of this insightful uh, dialogue. Um, together, we have laid a very good foundation um, in the topic. Um, I believe we're going to continue to have this conversation, a very rich one. And um, here by my left, where you had your uh, breakfast, we are now having our lunch. Um, so once again, thank you so much.